Hebrews chapter 8 Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. 8 colon 1 dash 5 Levitical priests served as an example and shadow of heavenly things. 8 colon 6 7 Christ is the mediator of a better covenant than Moses. 8 colon 8 dash 13 The new covenant and the five I wills of God. How did God solve the sin problem for the body of Christ? By giving us his son's imputed righteousness by faith, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 How did God solve Israel's problem? Israel could not keep God's commandments, so they could not be a kingdom of priests, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. God's solution to Israel's problem is the new covenant. God will cause you to keep my statutes, Ezekiel 36 verse 25, by giving them his spirit, putting his laws in their mind and writing them on their hearts of flesh, not on stone tablets, to enable them to keep his commandments and be a kingdom of priests, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. Hebrews is a transition book going from the old covenant to the new. Their high priest in heaven is better than the priests on earth, because the real is better than the shadow. The true tabernacle in the heavens is better than the tabernacle that Moses pitched, because the Lord pitched it. Christ has a more excellent ministry, priesthood, than the Levitical priests. The new covenant is better than the old which they could not keep. The new covenant is based on better unconditional promises than the old. The book of Hebrews is informing the future believing remnant in Israel of the changes in God's program for them since Christ's sacrificial death for their sins on the cross. The writer is showing that new covenant is better than the old. That they should move from the things of the Levitical priesthood to the more excellent ministry of Jesus Christ. To reject the real for what the old was a shadow and picture of, is to reject God. During the time of Jacob's trouble, many Jews will cling to Moses and the old covenant, offer animal sacrifices, reject the preaching of two witnesses, and the 144,000, and be deceived, Revelation 11 verses 3 and 4. The writer warns them to put the past behind them, and to move on to the new heavenly things to come, that Pentecost was a taste of, and that God will soon implement. They should move from the picture or pattern to the real thing. Christ is their high priest in heaven during the tribulation, but he will soon return to be their king on earth. Why did Israel need a new covenant and what exactly is the new covenant? What were the five I wills of God for Israel related to the new covenant? How long will the body of Christ live in the heavenly places? Ephesians 2 verse 6 Was the biblical regathering of Israel in 1948 or at his second coming? Who will accompany Jesus Christ at his second coming? God's eight covenants. Christ in relation to the covenants. 1. Edenic, Genesis 2 verses 16 and 17, free will. Men, not to disobey God's one rule. 1. Christ is the second man, the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 45 to 47, who restores what Adam lost, Hebrews 2 verses 7 to 9 and takes dominion, Revelation 11 verse 15. 2. Adamic, Genesis 3 verse 15, the seed of the woman to crush Satan's seed. 2. He is the seed of the woman that crushes the seed of the serpent, Genesis 3 verse 15, John 12 verse 31, Galatians 3 verse 16, Hebrews 2 verse 14, 1 John 3 verse 8, Revelation 20 verse 10. 3. Noahic, Genesis 9 verse 15, No more flood. Human government instituted. 3. A descendant of Noah through Shem, that will be the supreme governor, Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7. 4. Abrahamic, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3. I will bless them that bless you, and curse them that curse you. Continues in the tribulation. 4. He is the seed of Abraham through which all will be blessed, Genesis 22 verse 18. The Lord judge, Genesis 18 verse 25 and the possessor of heaven and earth, Genesis 14 verse 19. 5. Mosaic, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. If they keep his commandments then Israel will be a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Continues in the tribulation. 5. The son is a better prophet, priest, and king than Moses was, Deuteronomy 18 15, 33 colon 5, Acts 3 verses 22 and 23. Matt 12 colon 6, 41, 42, Hebrews 9 verse 19. 
6. Palestinian, Deuteronomy 30 verse 3, God will gather the Jews back into their land. 6. When he returns, he will send his angels to gather his elect from the four winds, Mat, 2400 hours 30, 31. 7. Davidic, 2 Samuel 7 verse 16, David's throne, and his son's throne shall be established forever. Continues in the tribulation. 7. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5 verse 5, the seed, heir, king over the whole earth, and David will help him rule over Israel, Matt, 1 colon 1, Luke 1 verses 31 to 33, Jeremiah 30 verse 9. 8. No covenant of God to the body of Christ, Romans 9 verse 4, Ephesians 2 verses 11 and 12, 16, but they are saved by faith in the blood of his cross and resurrection. 8. Paul said the Lord Jesus is the only potentate and king, 1 Timothy 6 verse 15, of his heavenly kingdom, 2 Timothy 4 verse 18. 9. New Covenant, Je 31, 31-34, Ezekiel 36 verses 24 to 28, Hebrews 8 verses 8 to 12, he will write his law in Israel's mind and in their hearts. 9. He is both the high priest and the perfect complete blood sacrifice that is the foundation of the new covenant, Matt, 26 28, Hebrews 9 verse 14, 1 Peter 1 verse 19. 8 1. Now of the things which we have spoken this is the sum. We have such an high priest, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, 2. A minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not men. Now the main point or some summary of what we have to say is this, we the Hebrews have such an high priest. By an oath, the father made his son the high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He is now seated on the right hand of the majesty, the father, in the heavens waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool, Psalms 110 verse 1. Jesus Christ was the prophet Moses spoke about when he was on earth, Deuteronomy 18 verse 15. Acts 3 verses 22 and 23. But now, when they are currently heading into the tribulation, Jesus is serving as their high priest in heaven. The true tabernacle in the heavens is better than the tabernacle that Moses pitched, because the Lord pitched, not men. 3. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. 4. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, 5, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, 4, C, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shewed to thee in the mount. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. So it stands to reason, that it was necessary that this man, Jesus Christ their high priest, have something to offer also. What did Christ offer in heaven? His blood. We will find out more details about Jesus Christ offering his sinless blood that he shed on Calvary in heaven in chapter 9, 1 Peter 1 verses 2 and 19, 1 John 1 colon 7, 5 colon 6 dash 8, Rev 1 colon 5, 5 colon 9, 7 14, 12 11. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest. Jesus Christ could not be part of the Aaronic priesthood because he was not from the tribe of Levi. These priests on earth serve as an example and shadow of the heavenly things. The priests on earth were partaking in a shadow of the real thing, the heavenly sanctuary. In contrast to the priests that served on earth as an example and shadow of the heavenly things, the Lord Jesus is the real thing. The Lord Jesus Christ is the express image of his person, the person of God the Father, 1 colon 3. For when Moses was about to build the tabernacle, he was admonished cautioned of God, see to it, he said, that you make all things according to the pattern Exodus 25 verse 40, that was shown to you in the mount. The original true sanctuary exists on Mount Zion in heaven, but there is another Mount Zion on earth in Jerusalem. Moses was able to look into the third heaven, so he could build an exact replica of the tabernacle he saw in heaven on earth. Their high priest in heaven is better than the priests on earth, because the real is better than the shadow. 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. But now, during the tribulation, Jesus Christ has obtained a more excellent ministry. 
Jesus Christ has a more excellent priesthood ministry than the Levites. By how much his better priesthood, he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Jesus Christ is a better mediator than those priests, and a mediator of a better covenant, the new covenant, with better promises, Galatians 3 verse 19. The writer does not minimize the old covenant, but shows the perfection and finality of the new. Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill, Matt 5.17. They are better promises because these promises are all God's, and all depend on God's integrity. The new covenant is all on God's part. Just like the covenants with Abraham and David were made all on God's part, unconditional, so is the new covenant. While the old covenant, X 19 to 24, was conditional on Israel keeping it. Israel entered into to a contract agreement with God at Mount Sinai. Israel promised to keep all the commandments God gave them. If they continued in obedience to the old covenant God would bless them, and if they broke it then God would curse them. Under the new covenant, they will willingly want to obey the Father and be his kingdom of priests. Israel promised to keep the law, but God knew they would fail. God allowed them to fail so they would understand their need for Christ's Spirit, the new covenant. They had inherited Adam's sin nature. In fact, each one was born a sinner. Sin was in their DNA. They needed new DNA, sin-free new eternal bodies. God needed to show them that they needed His Son's perfect Spirit in them along with new glorified bodies. The new covenant is based on better promises than the old, because the covenant is only what God will do for them, and does not depend on what they will do for God. Furthermore, since the new covenant rests only on Christ's finished work and blood sacrifice it is final and irreversible. Paul never called Jesus Christ a high priest to the body of Christ, but he did say that he is also our mediator Romans 8 verse 34, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. If there had been no problem, fault, with the first covenant, then there would be no reason for implementing the second in its place. Israel entered into a contract agreement with God at Mount Sinai. God had said, If you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. 8. For finding fault with them, for finding fault with them, the problem, fault, was with the Hebrew people, they could not keep the old covenant law because of their sinful flesh inherited by Adam, Romans 5 verse 12. They sinned and they had the sin nature in their flesh. The problem was that Israel could not keep God's covenant and therefore they could not be a kingdom of priests. They continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord, 8 colon 9. They could not keep his law so they could not be his priests. God did not regard them, and they could not be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. The children of Israel broke his covenant while Moses was on Mount Sinai. The fault was with the people of Israel who said three times, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do, Exodus 19 colon 8, 24 colon 3, 7, but then did not do what they had said they would. While God was writing the law on two stone tablets with his finger, they were worshipping the golden calf, Exodus 31 colon 18, 32 colon 19 dash 24. By agreeing to keep the covenant, Israel entered into a contract agreement with God at Mount Sinai. But by making an idol and worshipping it, they broke the first three commandments. 1. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, Exodus 20 verse 3, 2. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, Exodus 20 verse 4, and 3. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, Exodus 20 verse 5. The Israelites said about the molten calf, These be thy gods, O Israel which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, Exodus 32 verse 4. The children of Israel forsook the old covenant and made the golden calf. The golden calf really represented Satan, who was behind their rebellion. Satan was a cherub and one of his faces was that of a calf, Revelation 4 verse 7. They rose up to play, Exodus 32 verse 6. 
When Moses came down from the mountain, and saw what was happening his anger waxed hot, and he cast the tablets down, and they broke into pieces at the foot of the mountain. Aaron said that the people are set on mischief, and so the idol was made, Exodus 32 verses 19 to 24. God was angry and Moses knew it. Then Moses said, Who is on the Lord's side? All the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto Moses, and they killed with the sword three thousand men that had worshipped the golden calf, Exodus 32 verses 25 to 28. Moses had to return up on Mount Sinai to plead with God to forgive his people, and receive the law again. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written, Exodus 32 verses 31 and 32. Therefore, God did not regard the idol worshippers among the children of Israel, and he made the tribe of Levi his priests, instead of the whole nation. Many Jews in the tribulation will worship Antichrist and his image, instead of their real Messiah. Antichrist does not only mean against God, but instead or in place of. When God was about to punish the house of Judah, and remove them out of the promised land that he had given them, in that dark day, God graciously made them a promise of a new covenant, a better hope. Even in Jeremiah's day, they could not hear his voice and voluntarily remove themselves from the land of Judah as God asked. Therefore, God had to physically remove them using the Babylonians to take them captive. This was their political fall. God's solution to Israel's problem is the new covenant. The promised new covenant is to both the house Judah and the house of Israel become one in Hebrews 8 verse 10. The two sticks representing the divided kingdom will become one stick, or united kingdom, Ezekiel 37 verses 16 and 17. Notice the five I wills of God, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, nine, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. 10 For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. 12 For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. The words New Covenant are only found four times in the Bible, Jeremiah 31 verse 31, Hebrews 8 verses 8 and 13, 12 24. These five I wills of God will happen in the future. The Holy Ghost says, after those days, meaning, after the tribulation, the seventieth week of Daniel. Upon his return is when he will make a new covenant, Acts 3 verses 19 to 21. He will put his law into their mind, and will write them in their hearts. They will all have the mind of Christ. Hebrews 8 verses 8 to 12 quotes Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel the northern tribes, and with the house of Judah the southern tribes, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house. Of Israel, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34. The verse in Hebrews says, Put my laws into their mind, while Jeremiah says, inward parts. Hebrews replaces, covenant they break, with continued not in my covenant, and leaves out God being, an husband to them. The Lord promised the new covenant long ago, about 600 years before Christ. It was not like the covenant that he made with their fathers, the twelve tribes of Israel, when the Lord took them by the hand like little children, and led them out of Egypt to Sinai, Acts 7 verse 36. The new covenant depends on God's integrity and is absolutely unconditional and since no responsibility is committed to men, 
it is final and irreversible. It depends on God's five I wills. The Lord does not say you will to Israel. The new covenant will not be based on the if-then principle, nor upon the fear of punishment, but on a willing heart like Christ's. The new covenant is better than the old which they could not keep. The new covenant was all on God's part, his promises of what he would do for them, with no obligation on their part other than to believe the gospel of the kingdom, and endure to the end. God says I will cause you to walk in my statutes, Ezekiel 36 verse 27, by putting his law in their minds and writing them on their hearts of flesh, not on stone tablets, and giving them his spirit to enable them to keep his commandments and be his kingdom of priests. They will then be able to continue in his new covenant and evangelize the Gentiles. This is how they can be his peculiar, priced possession. They can then be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation. These are the words which thou, Moses, shalt speak unto the children of Israel, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. The new covenant is God's solution for Israel's problem. The Israel of God, the believing remnant, will be God's people. God will make a nation of Israel out of his earthly followers, the group that began with Peter, Messianic Judaism, and those that believe during the tribulation. As a result, God can have regard for them, and they can be his people. God said, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Israel will have total forgiveness as a nation of priests in the kingdom when the new covenant is in effect. God will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and after they have his righteousness, his spirit in them, he will not remember their sins and iniquities any more. The old covenant pointed out their sins and iniquities, but Christ kept the law perfectly, and with his spirit in them, there will not be any more sins or iniquities to remember. At his second coming, Christ will blot out Israel's national sins against him, which began at Sinai because they were sons of Adam. Furthermore, they will not need to teach other Jews the law because all will know the Lord, from the smallest to the greatest. They will all understand his word because they will all have his spirit within their hearts. When Christ returns all living believing Israel will be born again as a nation in one day and receive glorified bodies, Exodus 4 verse 22, Isaiah 66 verse 8, John 3 verse 7, Romans 11 verses 26 and 27. The rest of the believing dead will be raised shortly after that. Christ will also judge the Gentile nations at that time. The nations that bless the believing remnant of Israel will be allowed to enter the kingdom, while the Gentile nations that did not bless the believing remnant will be cast into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46. The whole nation, all will know me. With his law written in their minds, in Psalm 119 his word is the law, they will have the divine mind of Christ, and with his laws in their hearts, they will have the heart of Christ, his mind, will and emotions. Jesus Christ is the word, John 1 verses 1 to 3. He and his word cannot be separated, John 6 verses 53 to 63. There will be a special relationship between their priest king and them. His nation of kings and priests will go and teach the Gentile nations in prophecy, Isaiah 60 verses 1 to 3, Matthew 28 verse 19, Revelation 1 colon 6, 5, 10. The writer will soon indicate that Christ's cross and resurrection made the new covenant possible. David did not want to remember his sins, Psalms 51 verse 9. Since God will not remember Israel's sins any more, it stands to reason that God will not remember our sins in heaven any more. With Christ's spirit in us and sin-free glorified bodies, there will be no more sins in us. If God doesn't remember our sins, neither should we. Yea. How long will the body of Christ live in the heavenly places? Ephesians 2 verses 6 and 7. We will live eternal in the heavens, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. Paul blasphemed the Holy Ghost so he cannot enter the kingdom on earth, Matthew 12 verses 31 and 32, 1 Timothy 1 verse 13. Our home is in heaven, we are his heavenly people, and we have no reason to leave our territory, Ephesians 1 verse 3, Colossians 3 verse 1. 2 Timothy 4 verse 18. The body of Christ will be delivered from the wrath to come, 1 Thess, 1 10, 5 colon 9. 13, in that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. 
now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. In that God called what he would do a new covenant that means he has made the first covenant old. When will the old covenant vanish away? The covenant law they received from Moses was now waxing old, growing old obsolete, and is ready to vanish away, but it has not vanished yet. For this reason, the tribulation saints should not hold on to the old covenant, but look forward to the new. The old covenant law has not yet been replaced, but will be replaced after the tribulation when Christ returns. God is offering them a better covenant than they had been under. The Hebrews need to be aware and alerted to the changes of God's program for them and be ready to make the transition that will commence when he returns and sets up his kingdom. They should not go back to the old covenant but press on to the new. The new covenant is also explained in Ezekiel 36 verses 24 to 28. Notice that none of the covenants belong to the body of Christ. Paul said that all the covenants belong to Israel, Romans 9 verse 4, Ephesians 2 verses 11 to 13. Peter said unto you therefore which believe he is precious Jesus Christ, the chief corner stone, but unto them which be disobedient unbelieving in Israel, the stone which the builders of the scribes and Pharisees disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner head of the kingdom, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. God in his foreknowledge knew the religious leaders of Israel, would not believe and obey. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 1 Peter 2 verses 7 to 10. The believing remnant was not a nation, but God will make his nation out of the little flock who the religious leaders thought was a foolish group to believe that Jesus was their Messiah. The song of Moses that all Jews were to commit to memory says, They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God, they have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation Deuteronomy 32 verse 21. To show his love for Israel and her unfaithfulness to him, God told Hosea to marry a harlot and have children by her. Now when she had weaned lo Rehuma, no mercy on the house of Israel, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, Call his name lo Ami, for ye are not my people, Israel did not worship God in their hearts, and I will not be your God, Hosea 1 verses 8 and 9. Then their merciful God gives them a future hope. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered, and it shall come to pass, that in the place Israel where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God, Hosea 1 verse 10. When his believing remnant are gathered to him, God will say they are his people, Hosea 1 verse 11. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy, and I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God, Hosea 2 verse 23. Please note that the Lord Jesus said that the regathering of believing Israel would be at his second coming, Psalms 50 verse 5. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other, Matt, 2400 hours 30, 31. This was not what happened in 1948. Christ is not ruling in Jerusalem today. Under the new covenant they will keep God's law and God will say they are my people. The Lord Jesus will make his nation out of the believing remnant. Christ told the scribes and Pharisees, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof, Matt, 2143. But Jesus Christ told his followers, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, Luke 12 verse 32. On Pentecost Peter said, For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ, Acts 2 verses 34 to 36. 
One year later, Stephen told the religious leaders of Israel that he saw the Lord Jesus standing ready to judge, bring the tribulation and return, but instead he sat down at the right hand of the Father, Psalms 110 verse 1, Acts 7 verses 55 and 56. These leaders knew Stephen was confirming what Peter had already said, that they were his enemies so stopping their ears they charged him in their rage bit him, and then stoned Stephen to death, Psalms 37 verse 12, Acts 7 verse 54. The time was ripe for God to judge the world with the tribulation for it is written, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool, Psalms 110 verse 1. The Lord standeth up to plead, and standeth to judge the people, Isaiah 3 verse 13. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away, as wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God, Psalm 68 verses 1 and 2. But instead of returning in vengeance, the Father asked him to sit down again at his right hand, because the Father had more and more excellent ministry in mind for him. He began a new ministry from heaven to the body of Christ through Paul. He is the exalted head to his heavenly body of Christ believers, Ephesians 1 verses 22 and 23. Paul said the Father exalted his Son, far above all principality, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, Ephesians 1 verse 21. He ascended up far above all heavens, Ephesians 4 verse 10. Paul also calls the members of the body of Christ a peculiar people because we are also his priced blood-bought possession. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works, Titus 2 verse 14. Since the Son was made perfect by the things he suffered, his blood sacrifice on Calvary, the Father also made the Son the high priest to Israel according to the order of Melchizedek. After the rapture, he will begin his office as the priest king to his kingdom on earth believers during the tribulation before he returns in great power and glory to rescue the believing remnant, defeat Satan, and his policy of evil. For thou, Lord, art high above all the earth, thou art exalted far above all gods, Psalms 97 verse 9. Who will accompany Jesus Christ at his second coming? He will return with the armies which were in heaven, Revelation 19 verse 14. The Lord Jesus said, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, Matthew 16 verse 27. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, Matthew 25 verse 31. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory, and in his Father's, and of the holy angels, Luke 9 verse 26. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints, Jude 1 verse 14. The saints are the holy angels, saints just means holy ones. While it is true that the tribulation saints wear white, Revelation 19 verse 8, the angels also wear white clothes, Mark 16 verse 5, Acts 1 verse 10. People who do not rightly divide are confused because when Christ comes at the rapture to meet the believers in the body of Christ in the air, he brings the souls and spirits of the dead believers in Christ so they can be unified with their celestial eternal bodies, 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 16 and 17, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 40 and 51, 52. The gap or length of time before Antichrist signs the covenant and begins the prophetic clock is not known, as mentioned in chapter 3. The tribulation will last seven years until his second coming. The believing remnant will see Jesus coming in the clouds, Zechariah. 12 10, 13 colon 6, Luke 21 verses 25 to 28, Revelation 1 verse 7. Jesus Christ is the supreme ruler of both realms, heaven and earth. He will be serving as Israel's high priest from heaven during the tribulation. Their high priest king is the mediator of a better covenant, the new covenant, which is established on better promises for his nation that will reign with him as kings and priests. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth, Revelation 5 verse 10. The New Covenant, New Song, Summarized One, better than the Mosaic Covenant and Israel will be able to keep it. Two, God will cause Israel to keep the New Covenant, Ezekiel 36 verses 24 to 28. 3. Israel will be able to be a kingdom of priests and teach the Gentiles. 
4. It is unconditional, God's eternal promises, not their performance. 5. Israel will obey willingly, like Christ, and not out of fear. 6. God will regard and love them, and they will know him and his word. 7. Their conscience will be clear since the son's blood sacrifice was complete. 8. Israel will be able to go into the Father's presence like their priest king. The Ten Commandments Tabernacle Furnishing All the types of Christ's are in John. Door of the Tabernacle Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep, John 10 verse 7. Laver Jesus Christ washed the apostles' feet, Exodus 30 verses 17 to 21, John 13 verses 6 to 10, so they could function to minister as a kingdom of priests, Exodus 19 verse 6. Brazen Altar The place where the lamb sacrifice was burned. John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1 verse 29. Golden Candlestick Jesus said, I am the light of the world, John 8 verse 12. Table of Showbread I am the bread of life, John 6 verse 35. Golden Censer Prayers are like sweet incense to God. Jesus prayed, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, John 17 verse 20. Ark of the Covenant A box made of wood, the humanity of Christ, was overlaid with gold, the deity of Christ. The mercy seat is on top of the ark. Propitiation means the atoning sacrifice on the mercy seat. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, 1 John 2 verse 2. Golden Pot of Manna Inside the ark were three things, 1, the golden pot of manna, John 6 verse 35. Aaron's rod that budded. 2, Aaron's rod that budded, Jesus said, I am the true vine, John 15 verse 1, the rod was dead but came alive. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, John 11 verse 25. Tables of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments. 3. The stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, Jesus will provide a new and living way. I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father, but by me, John 14 verse 6. The Day of Atonement. The high priest offered a young bullock for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, Leviticus 16 verse 3. For the congregation of the children of Israel, two kid goats were chosen, one for a sin offering, and the other for a scapegoat, and one ram for a burnt offering, Leviticus 16 verse 5. The censer held burning coals from the altar of incense unto which was added a handful of incense. The cloud of smoke from the incense covered the mercy seat to obscure God's presence, Leviticus 16 verses 12 and 13. The high priest sprinkled the blood from his finger upon the mercy seat between God and the broken law. Then he would go out and slit the throat of the other goat for the people, and return to the holiest place with the blood, and do the same with that blood for their sins, Leviticus 16 verse 15. Then he would go out of the holy place to the altar of incense, and put blood on the horns, and cleanse it, and the other vessels with the blood to make atonement for the sanctuary. He would then go out and place his hands on the scapegoat, and confess all the sins of Israel's people. He then put them upon the head of the goat and sent him away, by the hand of a fit man, into the wilderness. He would then return to the sanctuary and remove his priestly garments, slay and offer a burnt offering for himself, another for the people, and the fat of the sin offering, Leviticus 16 verses 24 and 25. The man who took the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe, and return unto the camp, Leviticus 16 verse 26. The remains of the bullocks and the goat used for the blood sacrifice for the sin offering shall be carried without the camp and completely burned. Being a priest was a bloody job. Afterward, they had to clean up the blood. They are to afflict their souls on the tenth day of the seventh month, the day of atonement, which is a statute forever, Leviticus 16 verse 29. It is a Sabbath rest, holy day. This is a day of cleansing every year from sins by the priest, so you may be clean before the Lord. Chapter 9 The first sanctuary and service were mere types. 9 colon 1-10 
the service of the first covenant was divinely instituted. 9.11-22 Christ has become a high priest of the good things to come. 9.23-28 The heavenly sanctuary was purified by a better sacrifice and blood. The hope of the nine letters, Hebrews to Revelation, is eternal life in the kingdom. Much of the Bible is devoted to preparing Jesus Christ's believing remnant to endure the tribulation. Contrasted throughout this chapter are the Old and New Covenants. Although the terms covenant and testament are related, they are not the same. The old sanctuary was a type of the new. The word covenant equals deal or contract, whereas the word testament equals last will. A testament is not in force until after the death of the testator, 917. The word purge, 914, and purged, 1 colon 3, 922, 10 colon 2, is an important concept in Hebrews. Purged means cleansed, washed away, expunged, flushed out, removed, eradicated, and eliminated. Christ purged our sins on the cross, he completely disposed of them. He was the perfect sacrifice, and without sin. He paid for their sins by himself with his blood, put sin away in his burial, and rose victorious three days later. The name of the Son is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It is he that came the first time, and was crucified, Revelation 1 verses 6 to 8. The Son suffered at his first coming. At his second coming in glory, Christ will be triumphant, rescue his people, vanquish his enemies, and set up his glorious millennial kingdom. The old covenant was only temporary. Christ confirmed his new covenant with the shedding of his blood. The new covenant will allow them to be purged of sins, clear their conscience of shame and guilt like Drano cleans clogs from plumbing. Christ's death as the Lamb of God and the sacrifice of his blood as their high priest purged and permanently put away their sins. Under the new covenant, with his spirit in them, they will be unclogged of sin and able to have a personal relationship with God as his sons and serve the living God as his kingdom of priests. What is the difference between a covenant and a testament? Why was not even the high priest's conscience clear on the day of atonement? What did Christ offer in heaven? What does eternal spirit mean? What was Nicodemus supposed to understand? 9.1 Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service, and a worldly sanctuary. The old covenant had laws of divine service ordered by God, and a worldly sanctuary. The worldly sanctuary refers to the tabernacle on earth. It was not a permanent structure but a movable tent. The Old Testament sacrifices and services allowed God to continue a relationship with his, guilty, people until their sins would be paid for on the cross by his son. 2. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. 3. And after the second veil, the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, 4. Which had the golden censer, and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, five. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. The service of the first covenant was divinely instituted. The first compartment, or room, in the tabernacle, tent, is called the sanctuary. The second compartment, or room, is called the holiest of all. The furniture contained in the first room, the sanctuary consisted of the candlestick, the table, altar of incense, and the table of showbread. The showbread had twelve loaves of bread symbolic for the priests of the twelve tribes of Israel to feed upon Christ's word and share it, Matthew 4, 16, 9, John 6, verse 63. The names of the twelve tribes of Israel, Jacob's sons, are found in Genesis 35, verses 22 to 26, 49, 1-28 and 1 Chronicles 2 verses 1 and 2. God would be able to deal with Israel in a new way because of Christ's blood sacrifice for their sins on the cross. The tabernacle pointed to Jesus Christ. All of the types of Christs are found in the Gospel of John. Jesus was the door to the sanctuary he said, I am the door of the sheep, John 10 verse 7. The laver with its foot provided cleansing of the priest's hands and feet. Jesus Christ washed the apostles' feet, Exodus 30 verses 17 to 21, John 13 verses 6 to 10, 
so they could function to minister as a kingdom of priests, Exodus 19 verse 6, in the kingdom which was near, at hand, Exodus 29 verse 4, Matthew 3 verse 2. The brazen altar was where they burned the lamb sacrifice. John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1 verse 29. When Christ was suffering the fiery second death for our sins on the cross, he said, I thirst, John 19 verse 28. Inside the first room was the golden candlestick. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, John 8 verse 12. On the other side was the table of showbread, Jesus said, I am the bread of life, John 6 verse 35. Behind the second veil was the holiest place of all. It was where they brought the golden censer. The smoke of the golden censer, with the burning incense, was to obscure the mercy seat on the day of atonement so that we the high priest would die not Leviticus 16 verses 12 and 13. The Ark of the Covenant was a box made of wood, representing the humanity of Christ, overlaid with gold, representing the deity of Christ. On top of the Ark were the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. The writer does not want to address the particulars of the mercy seat right now. The mercy seat of gold was on top of the box where God met with the high priest, Exodus 25 verses 10 and 21, 22. Inside the ark were three things, one, the golden pot of manna. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, John 6 verse 35, 2, Aaron's rod that budded, Jesus said, I am the true vine, John 15 verse 1. The rod was dead but came alive. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, John 11 verse 25, and 3, the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. Jesus will provide a new way, not cold stone but life and truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14 verse 6. The triune Godhead had decided that Christ would be the propitiation to reconcile the people of Israel and the Father. Propitiation means atoning sacrifice, and the term is found three times in the Bible in Romans 3 verse 25, 1 John 2 verse 2, and 4:10, and has to do with the Father being satisfied by His Son's blood payment for their sins. And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, 1 John 2 verse 2. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was a holy satisfying sacrifice that satisfied the justice of God as prophesied. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities, Isaiah 53 verse 11. The Lord Jesus came the first time to save his people from their sins, Matthew 1 verse 21, for although they were children of Abraham, they were also children of Adam. 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. 7. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself, and for the errors of the people. 8. The Holy Ghost this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. 9. Which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. 10 which stood only in meats and drinks, and divers washings, and carnal ordinances, imposed on them until the time of reformation. Now when God divinely ordained these things, the priests went continually into the first room of the tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. But into the second room went only the high priest alone once every year, on the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, and not without blood. He offered the blood for his own errors, sins, and for the errors of the people. The high priest had to make atonement for them every year since they sinned so God could be present with them. The Holy Ghost therefore signifying, indicating, that the way into the holiest of all was, not yet made manifest or revealed. While the first tabernacle was standing, access to God was not open to all the priests, or people, all the time, but only the high priest could enter the holiest place once a year. The holiest of all was a figure, or type that proclaimed before Christ's sacrifice that the gifts and sacrifices the high priest offered were not adequate. They could not make the high priest perfectly acceptable to God nor remove a guilty conscience. Even the high priest who performed the service on the Day of Atonement could not have a completely clear conscience after making the sacrifices. 
Deep down, he knew that animal sacrifices were not adequate to pay for his sins. The service could not entirely free him from guilt and shame of having done wrong. There was a restrictive barrier to their access and friendship with Holy God. Their conscience still bothered them. The sacrificial system was only a figure or type of the real future sacrifice. The animal sacrifices merely covered their sins for another year. The ceremonial sacrifices of food, drink, various washings, carnal ordinances, physically written laws, were imposed on the Israelites until the time of the Reformation. At that time God would reshape the way he dealt with them. The Reformation was possible because of Christ's payment for sins by the shedding of his blood on the cross. Reformation means to form or shape again. The time of the Reformation would allow God to deal with Israel in a new way, through the new covenant because of the blood of Christ. The time of Reformation refers to the refreshing and restitution, the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, Acts 3 verse 19, at his second coming. It will be the times of restitution of all things, Acts 3 verse 21, when Christ restores what Adam lost. The curse will be lifted and the millennial kingdom will begin. The believing remnant of Israel will be enabled to keep his law by his spirit. At last they will become a kingdom of priests to reconcile the Gentiles to God, as they were destined, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. The head, not the tail, Deuteronomy 28 verse 13. Paul said that the body of Christ has atonement now, we also join in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement, Romans 5 verse 11. 11 But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, 12 neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. But Jesus Christ has become a high priest of future good things to come. When Israel is functioning as a kingdom of priests under the new covenant, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. Not an earthly tabernacle. Christ's body is the veil of the greater and more perfect tabernacle, 1020. He went into the holy place, in heaven, once and obtained eternal salvation for us, Hebrews. Christ has become a high priest in the tabernacle in heaven, not the tabernacle Moses built. He did not offer the blood of goats and calves. He entered once into the holy place in heaven and offered his own blood, and obtained eternal redemption for us, the Hebrews. After shedding his blood on Calvary, he made atonement for them in heaven as their high priest. He sprinkled his blood for us, the Hebrews' sins in the tabernacle in heaven. It was by his blood that obtained eternal redemption for us, Hebrews. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that mocketh an atonement for the soul, Leviticus 17 verse 11. Christ finished the payment for sins, by his shed blood, on the cross, and obtained eternal redemption for them. He entered once into the holiest place and sprinkled his blood as their high priest on the real mercy seat in heaven. After his resurrection, he asked Mary Magdalene not to touch him, which would contaminate his pure blood offering. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God, John 20 verse 17. Christ had paid for Israel's sins and made reconciliation with his blood, so now his Father and his God is their Father and their God. Christ did not want his blood defiled before he completed his payment for sins and cleansed the heavenly sanctuary. Christ has entered into the holiest place of all in heaven with his blood on their behalf to purify and purge the sins of the people of Israel. Early on the morning of his resurrection, Christ ascended and entered into the tabernacle in heaven behind the veil of the holy place. There he offered his blood before his father on the throne. The son did not have to offer his blood for his own sins because he had none, but he sprinkled his blood for the sins of the people. His blood also cleansed and sanctified the third heaven. God first found iniquity in the cherub that covered his throne named Lucifer. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, 
till iniquity was found in the Ezekiel 28 verses 14 and 15. Lucifer had led a rebellion in heaven against God, and a third of the angels had joined him. All of the third heaven was utterly cleansed and purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. The Son of God made an end of sins and reconciliation for iniquity, Daniel 9 verse 24. Iniquity is a selfish rebellious anti-God attitude. The Lord returned to earth shortly, and when he saw some of the women that were his followers, he allowed them to touch his feet, Matthew 28 verse 9. The church, the body of Christ, is also redeemed by the blood of the New Testament, but God has not made any covenants deals with us. The Son of God died in our place and paid the sin debt we owed with his blood, 2 Cor 3 colon 6, 5 19, Colossians 1 verses 13 and 14. 13 For if the blood of bulls and of goats, and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, 14 How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Jesus Christ's was the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1 verse 29. If God accepted the blood of bulls, goats, and ashes of a heifer as temporary sanctification and purification of their sinful flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Christ offered himself through the eternal spirit. All three members of the Godhead were in Christ accomplishing the eternal redemption for mankind, Galatians 1 verse 1, John 10 verse 18, Romans 8 verse 11. The word spirit appears in the Bible 505 times, but does not always refer to the Holy Ghost. Jesus, who was the only person of the Godhead to put on human flesh, said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, John 4 verse 24. The Holy Father is spirit, the Son is spirit, and the Holy Ghost is spirit. When the King James Bible says Holy Ghost, it refers specifically to the Holy Ghost. However, when the Bible says Spirit, then it could be referring to any one of the three persons of the Godhead, and the context must help us decide which one. Asterisk please note that all modern Bibles eliminate the name, Holy Ghost, and replace it with the Holy Spirit, and the distinction between them is lost. Sometimes the Spirit is Christ's, sometimes it is the Holy Ghost's, and at other times it is the Father's. Jesus offered himself without spot. Christ did not inherit Adam's sinful nature because he was conceived by the Holy Ghost, and the baby's and the mother's blood do not mix. The Son of God had no sins of his own. Therefore his satisfactory sacrifice could completely purge, cleanse, their conscience from dead works. Their conscience told them that animal blood was inadequate to remove their sins. But they can be eternally permanently purged clean of sin, and have a clear conscience knowing that the Son of God's blood was more than adequate payment for their sins. With his Spirit in them, the little flock can be a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, and serve the living God. God had promised to blot out Israel's sins. I have blotted out, as a thick cloud, thy transgressions, and as a cloud, thy sins, return unto me, for I have redeemed thee, Isaiah 44 verse 22. Peter said that the blotting out of sins will happen when Jesus returns. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, Acts 3 verse 19. With his spirit in them, his law in their mind and heart, they will be oblivious to their past guilt and shame. After the cross, there was no longer the need to offer animals blood, because Christ offered his blood as the perfect final sacrifice for sins. Christ's blood offering permanently purged, eradicated, their sins. Jesus Christ by himself purged our sins, 1 colon 3, so we will no longer have any guilt or shame, and can serve the living God. Christ's blood was 100% perfect and pure, it was God's blood, Acts 20 verse 28. The Son of God was without spot, without blemish, Exodus 12 verse 5, Hebrews 7 verse 26, 1 Peter 2 verse 22, the sinless Lamb of God, John 1 verses 29 and 36, Acts 8 verse 32. 1 Peter 1 colon 1 colon 9, Revelation 5 verses 6 to 13, 13 colon 8, 22 colon 3. At Passover the blood on the posts caused the destroyer to pass over that house, and not check who inside were worthy, Exodus 12 verses 21 to 23. 
When the father sees his son's blood applied to the believer, he knows their sins are not just covered but completely dealt with. 15 And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. This cause is their eternal redemption. 9-12 He is the mediator of the New Testament. His death, shed blood, provided for the redemption of transgressions of the First Covenant, their individual sins, and sins as a nation. God deals with them as a nation. As a nation they made and worshipped the golden calf and transgressed the first covenant. As a nation, Israel transgressed God's laws at Sinai. God dealt with Israel individually and nationally. Israel had to confess their individual sins and their national sins, Leviticus 26 verses 40 to 45, 1 John 1 verse 9. But Jesus Christ kept the law perfectly and never transgressed against God. He has redeemed the nation and paid for the transgressions made at Sinai. So that, those who are called, believe the gospel of the kingdom, and that Jesus of Nazareth is their Messiah who came and suffered as their sacrifice, might receive the promise of eternal inheritance, eternal life in the eternal kingdom in the promised land if they endure to the end. The Lord Jesus Christ said that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached in the tribulation, Matthew 24 verses 12 and 13. In the tribulation, the kingdom will be even closer and more at hand than it was when Christ was on earth. Antichrist will try to fool many in Israel and worldwide into thinking that he is the Messiah. Because Christ would negotiate an entirely new testament, the Father held back his judgment of them and allowed their sins to be covered temporarily with the blood of animals, knowing his Son would pay for their sins through his death. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, Romans 3 verse 25. The past sins are the sins done before Christ's death. The Father forbear destroying the believer because he knew Christ would pay for their sins. Israel sinned under the First Testament. But with his Son's righteousness, his Spirit, his life, these are the same, in them, God can declare them righteous. Not because of anything they did, but because of what his son did by his faith. Therefore, the saints in Abraham's bosom were able to be taken to heaven as soon as Jesus Christ was resurrected. Those that believe Jesus Christ is their Messiah and endure to the end will receive the promise of eternal inheritance in the kingdom. On Pentecost, Peter also mentioned the remission of sins. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, change your minds, about who Christ our Messiah is and be baptized, water baptized for a ceremonial priesthood cleansing, not a water burial every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of forgiveness of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2 verse 38. The word remission is found only in the New Testament. Repenting of sins and being water baptized is not the same gospel by which the body of Christ is saved, our gospel is 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. 16 For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. 17 For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Where there is a last will and testament involved, there must first be the death of the one that set up the will. A last will and testament is not enforced until after men are dead. It has no legal power as long as the one who made it is alive. A covenant is not the same thing as a testament although the terms are related. A covenant is a deal or contract often between two parties, while a testament is a last will that is in force after the person who made the will dies. A testament usually allocates an inheritance. Christ had to die for the New Testament to go into effect. The King James Bible perfectly translates the word testament from the same Greek word, diatheik, that means covenant. Paul wrote, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood, this do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me, 1 Corinthians 11 verses 23-25. The bread in the cup is a simple picture that helps our group remember what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. 
18 whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. 19 for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats, with water, and scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book, and all the people, 20 saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. God's first will and testament, the old covenant, like the new testament, was also dedicated by blood, but it was animal blood. After Moses had read every precept, all 613 laws, he took the blood of slain calves and goats with water, red wool, and hyssop and sprinkled the blood on both the book, and all the people. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord hath said will we do, and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words, Exodus 24 verses 7 and 8. What had Moses been doing on Mount Sinai for forty days? He was writing down what God said, taking dictation. After Moses read the fine print to them, all God's 613 laws, they should have screamed, Stop! This is too much, we can't keep all these laws. It was a bad deal that they should never have agreed to. Israel should have said right then and there, We cannot keep your law. We have sin in our lives, and we need a better covenant. Please, just keep your promises to us like you told Abraham. But Israel thought she could keep God's 613 laws recorded in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. God had to let Israel fail, so that she would understand their need for the Son of God's Spirit in them. We learn a lot from our failures. The law was never meant to make someone righteous before God but to prove that all are unrighteous before God, Romans 3 verses 19 and 20. In their pride, Israel thought they could keep his laws. Paul described this fault perfectly. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, Romans 10 verse 3. Israel broke many of the 613 laws, the fine print of the First Testament. The blood of the animals ratified the testament that God hath enjoined or made with them. 21 Moreover he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Additionally, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the sacred vessels of the ministry. 22 And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. According to the law God gave to Moses almost all things are purged or cleansed by blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, forgiveness of sins. The just punishment for sin deserves death, Romans 6 verse 23. The writer says, almost, there are no sacrifices for certain crimes such as murder and adultery. Animal blood was required for temporary forgiveness of sins. God instituted the sacrificial system after Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. This sacrificial system continued from Abel to Moses all the way to Christ's cross. The trail of blood that began in the Garden ended on Calvary. It was a gracious system of mercy that restored fellowship between God and the sinner, but it was a temporary system until Christ came, Exodus 20 verse 24, Leviticus 17 verse 11, Romans 3 verse 25. Cain acknowledged that God was the source of his bountiful produce from the earth. However, God did not accept Cain's bloodless sacrifice, but God acknowledged and accepted Abel's sacrifice. Abel obeyed the instructions revealed to him. Abel recognized that he was a sinner that deserved death, but that God was willing to accept the blood of a substitute lamb. Abel was obedient to do as God instructed and do it on God's terms. Religion is men attempting to come to God in his preferred way on his own terms. 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The pattern of the things in heaven needed to be purified by animal blood, but the heavenly things required better sacrifices than these. Moses used the blood of calves and of goats, with water, and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book, and all the people, but the heavenly things were purified with better sacrifices than these animal sacrifices. The better sacrifice than these was the blood of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. When the tabernacle was inaugurated, Moses sprinkled the book that had all the 613 laws, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers but Deuteronomy was not written yet, and the people of Israel. 
Then Moses sprinkled the tabernacle, and all the vessels of the ministry. It was, therefore, necessary that their high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, should do the same thing in heaven with better sacrifices than animals. With his own blood, their high priest made eternal atonement for them in heaven, and then he cleansed the heavenly tabernacle. Jesus Christ was the all-sufficient fully satisfying sacrifice. The vessels in heaven that were the pattern for the things on earth needed to be purified by Christ's blood, just like they had been when Moses dedicated the tabernacle. 24 For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now Tio appear in the presence of God for us. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands on earth, which are figures, replicas, or types of the true, but Christ entered in behind the veil in heaven itself, now Tio appear in the presence of God for us Hebrews. The Lamb's very presence at the Father's right hand, and his scars even now witness of his sacrifice on Calvary that intercedes for us. God wants them to know that while they are going through the tribulation, Christ is now in the presence of the Father as their high priest, having made atonement for them. The Father, His Majesty, is on the throne, the mercy seat in heaven. Christ's presence there demonstrates that the Father accepted His perfect sacrifice. The Son ministers in a better sanctuary in heaven, Mount Shaun, not on earth. 25 Nor yet that He should offer Himself often, as the High Priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others, 26 For then must He often have suffered since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Christ did not need to offer himself as a sacrifice every year, like the high priest, that entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. The blood of other animals was not the blood of a man. They were sons of Abraham, but they were also sons of Adam. It was Adam that first sinned, and payment needed to be made for him. They offered the substitute blood of animals until the true Lamb of God came to take away the sins of the whole world, 1 John 2 verse 2. Asterisk please note that these are the sins in prophecy. However, Paul said, Christ died for our sins in mystery also, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. There is a distinction between Jews and Gentiles in prophecy and Jews and Gentiles in mystery. We are to be rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 between prophecy and mystery. Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. We are little, new creatures that have been baptized into the big, new creature, the body of Christ, with Christ as the head of the, one new man, Ephesians 2 verse 15. We are a living spiritual organism, a whole living being with interdependent parts. In contrast, Israel is to be a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. The hope for the body of Christ is the rapture and eternal life in heaven, while the hope for Israel is eternal life in the kingdom on earth. Christ is their king priest. Jesus Christ made a one-time payment for sins on Calvary, and a one-time sprinkling of his atoning blood to show the Father I have done as you asked. Christ died and paid for all the world's sins past, present, and future. He does not have to die for each new sin. To do so he would have had to begin with Adam's sins at the foundation of the world, and suffered every time someone sinned. Instead, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, for this he did once when he offered up himself, 727. Jesus Christ appeared once in the end of the world, because he came to put away Israel's sin in the 69th week of Daniel's prophecy concerning Israel's prophetic time clock of 70 weeks. The cross was at the end of 483 years with only seven years to go. The clock had one more prophesied week, seven years, left. This was the 70th week, the tribulation, before the completion of the timeline of 490 years, Dan 9,24-27. That week represented the end of the fallen world as they have known it and the good things to come, 9-11, will be in the world to come, 2,5. The restored restituted kingdom, once the curse on creation is lifted, will be as the Garden of Eden, Isaiah 11 verses 6 to 9, Ezekiel 36 verse 35. Christ willingly sacrificed himself, he did not save his own skin. Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yeah, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, 
and he will curse thee to thy face. Job 2 verses 4 and 5. But Jesus said, I lay down my life for the sheep. John 10 colon 15 b. And when Jesus Christ did, he permanently put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Christ's sacrifice erased or blotted out their sins because it was fully satisfying, complete, and final. But to have eternal life they need the new covenant. 27 And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, 28 So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. After men die God judges them. God judged his son's work as perfect and complete payment for sins. Those who trust in their high priest's sacrifice and have his blood applied to them will be judged by his work and not their own. Those who did not believe what God said to them will be judged by Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment of the lost. Those who believe will look for him to appear a second time, meaning he came the first time. He was born about 2,021 years ago. When Jesus Christ came the first time, he fulfilled more than 300 prophecies. There are many more prophecies to be fulfilled of his second coming. So, his return is inevitable. Stephen said that they did not recognize Joseph and Moses the first time they came, Acts 7 verses 13 and 35. He will appear without sin, not for the sake of dying for their sins, he already did that the first time he came, unto salvation. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, Christ's second coming, 1 Peter 1 verse 5. Christ will save his beloved remnant and make a nation out of them at his second coming. They will receive their eternal bodies and his spirit in them under the new covenant. When they see him, they shall be like him. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that, when he shall appear a second coming, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, 1 John 3 verse 2. They will instantly have glorified bodies and be kings and priests, similar to him as prophesied. They will have young bodies, and when they see God's face, they will have joy because God will render unto them his righteousness, Job 33 verses 24 to 26, Isaiah 54 verse 17. The nation will be born again in one day, Isaiah 66 verse 8. Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, John 3 verse 3. Nicodemus did not understand what Christ meant by born again, and wondered if he meant being born a second time by his mother. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee Nicodemus, ye the nation of Israel must be born again at Christ's second coming John. 3 colon 5 dash 7, what was Nicodemus supposed to understand? Nicodemus was supposed to understand that God had promised a new covenant in Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34 and Ezekiel. Nicodemus as a religious ruler, a member of the Sanhedrin of Israel, should have known the following verses. For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean, from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God, Ezekiel 36 verses 24 to 28. Under the new covenant, they will keep all his laws and be a kingdom of priests, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. The sprinkling of clean water references to the ceremonial water baptism cleansing of the priests, Exodus 29 verse 4. The water is the water baptism practiced by John, Jesus, and the apostles. John the Baptist called out a believing remnant that separated themselves from the apostate religious leaders. This group of believers was identified by having undergone a water baptism. Remember Peter also preached, Repent, and be baptized, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2 verse 38. Jesus told Nicodemus how he would die. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, 
Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life, John 3 verses 14 and 15. The Lord Jesus Christ heroically paid the price for the sins of all mankind by his loving sacrifice. He trusted in the Father's plan of redemption. Christ died and his sacrifice on mankind's behalf was judged acceptable. Mankind only has one life to decide where they will spend eternity. When men die, they are judged by whether or not they trusted what God said. Those who believed what God said to them will have eternal life. Those that look for him when he shall appear the second time, second coming, will receive salvation. Their high priest will return to them having been within the veil in the most holy place in heaven. The believers of Israel at his second coming will receive their national salvation. When they see him coming, they will be healed and instantly receive their glorified bodies like his. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is 1 John 3 verse 2. The believing Jews will have glorified bodies, but the believing Gentiles will not, but they will be invited to enter the kingdom. Just like some people will be alive at the rapture and changed in the twinkle of an eye into a new body, some tribulation saints will be alive and changed into glorified bodies upon Christ's return. If the Gentiles continue to believe after Satan is released, then they will be allowed to eat from the tree of life, Revelation 22 verse 14. The devil and his Gentile forces will surround Jerusalem and battle against King Jesus and his people. God will destroy the Gentile opposition with fire from heaven. After the unbelieving Gentiles have been exposed and disposed of, Satan will try to get away from the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ will hunt Satan down as hunting for Leviathan with a hook him, spear him, and cast the devil into the lake of fire, Job 41 verses 1 to 34, Isaiah 27 verse 1, Revelation 20 verse 10. Paul said that Jesus must reign until all his enemies are put under his feet. For he must reign, till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him of the Father. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him of the Father, that put all things under him of the Son, that God may be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 25 to 28 After Pentecost, Peter spoke of their time of refreshing, renewing of the earth and rebirth, at Christ's return to earth. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, Acts 3 verses 19 to 21. Unto salvation is future national salvation for Israel. Israel is waiting for Christ to come down, the body of Christ want to go up. God had to reconcile heaven first with the body of Christ, where the rebellion began, so those powers and principalities will no longer have influence on earth. God never changes but his instruction for salvation are different for different people. For this reason, it is important to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, so that a person knows what God has said to them. In the future, God will populate heaven and earth with glorified believers that have the spirit of the Son in them, but their souls will be unique. Prophesize Jesus Christ really was the Messiah, the Son of God, their promised King. He fulfilled many Old Testament promises. He was born of a virgin, Isaiah 7 verse 14, Matthew 1 verses 21 to 23, born in Bethlehem of Judea, Micah 5 verse 2, Matthew 2 verse 1. Born according to Daniel's timeline, Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27. He performed miracles of healing, Isaiah 35 verses 3 to 6, Matthew 11 verse 5. He preached the gospel of the kingdom, Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 3, Luke 4 verses 16 to 19, and so on. While they knew they were killing Jesus, they did not know they were killing their Messiah, through ignorance he did it Acts 3 verse 17. The Eight Sayings of Jesus Christ on the Cross 1. Father forgive them, for they know not what they do Luke 23 34 a.m. 
2. Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Luke 23 verse 43. 3. Woman, behold thy son. John 19 verse 26. 4. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. John 19 verse 27. 5. And at the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Aloy, Aloy, Lama Sabachthani. Which is, being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Mark 15 verse 34. 6. I thirst, Psalm 69 verse 21, John 19 verse 28. 7. It is finished, John 19 verse 30. 8. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, Psalms 31 verse 5, Luke 23 verse 46. Christ spoke eight times on the cross. In his first saying, he mentioned his father, and in his last saying, he mentioned his father demonstrating the intimacy they shared. The true believers will also be able to have a loving relationship with God the Father and his Son. Jesus saith unto her Mary Magdalene, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. John 20 verse 17. Christ took on flesh to be the sacrifice for Israel's sins. When Jesus asked his Father to forgive them, he reduced Israel's sentence of murder to manslaughter. Love is not love. God is love, 1 John 4 verse 8. Paul said, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5 verse 8. Hail and fire, Job 38 verse 22, Revelation 8 verse 7. The Lord shall draw out Leviathan. 153 fish in the net that did not break. The sevens of Revelation. Seven spirits of God. Seven seals of the book. Seven golden candlesticks. Seven stars in Christ's hand. Seven angels of the seven churches. Seven letters to seven churches. Seven eyes and seven horns of the Lamb. Seven mountains. Seven thunders. Seven kings. Seven angels with trumpets. Seven angels with vials. Seven heads and seven crowns of the dragon. Seven is the number for completion. Chapter 10 Warning not to sin willfully and lose their salvation. 10.1-18 Christ offered one sacrifice for sins forever. 10.19-25 Let us hold fast to our profession of faith, without wavering. 10.26-39 Warning not to sin willfully or draw back to perdition. There was a disturbing warning in 6 colon for dash 6, and there is another in 10 colon 26 dash 39. But the letter to the Hebrews, not the body of Christ, is loving and ends on an uplifting note. This chapter is the culminating climax of all that has been said. Is Hebrews another offer of salvation to Israel? No. They had one offer through Christ's earthly ministry, and a second offer through his followers Peter and the eleven. The religious leaders rejected the offer of the kingdom made by the power of the Holy Ghost. This was the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost that Christ warned them about, Matthew 12 verses 31 and 32. The nation fell because of unbelief, but the remnant believed and did not fall. God will pick up where he left off with them in Acts 15 and Gal 2. They who were told not to preach to the heathen, all lost, will once again be commissioned to preach to new converts. God will make the little flock his nation, Luke 12 verse 32. The knowledge of the truth, 1026, in Hebrews, prophecy, is different from the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, in Paul's letters Romans to Philemon, mystery. The will of God, 1036, is also different, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. In the mystery, God's will is for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth of the mystery program. Christ's group through Paul, the body of Christ, will live in the heavenly places, Romans 11 verse 13, F2 colon 6, 3 colon 1 dash 9. This group is separate from the kingdom on earth believers in the rest of the Bible. The Bible is divided into the Old Testament and the New Testament, 
but the Old Testament did not begin until Exodus 19, and the New Testament did not begin until after Christ died, at the end of each of the four Gospels. Why do the scriptures say in some places that the kingdom believers will be persecuted, while in other places they are protected during the tribulation? What exactly are the good things to come a shadow of? What is the will in by the which will Hebrews 10 verse 10? Why was Jesus Christ baptized? What is an evil conscience and can the Hebrews lose their salvation? What does it mean to sin willfully? What is the mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth? 10 colon 1 for the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. The law was not the very image of the true but a mere shadow of good things to come. What are the good things to come? Their high priests complete blood payment for their sins, eternal life in the kingdom, and them being a kingdom of priests under the new covenant. The new covenant will make them perfectly righteous in God's eyes and able to keep his commandments. The sacrifices described in the old covenant law can never make those that come to God and offer them year after year continually, eternally, prefect, holy and righteous. Dot. Two for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. 3. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. If those animal sacrifices could have made the worshippers holy and righteous before God, would they not have stopped being offered? Because if the worshipper of God was once purged completely of sins, they should have no more conscious awareness of sins and guilt they would know that their sins were completely dealt with. But in doing those sacrifices they were reminded again of their sins, plural, every year. Those sacrifices only served to remind them that God was holy, and they were not, and therefore they could not come into his presence. Not only that they were constantly reminded of their inability to keep his laws and be his kingdom of priests, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. There was a sin problem between them and God. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear, Isaiah 59 verse 2. The writer now states a fact, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. The Old Testament animal sacrifices could never completely remove their sins. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest offered sacrifices, confessed his sins and the people's sins, his deserving of death, and his faith in God's provision but his conscience still told him the animal sacrifices were not enough. What exactly was the law a shadow of? It was a shadow of the actual real payment of Christ. His blood sacrifice is the foundation of the new covenant. The old covenant was weak because those sacrifices were the blood of animals. Animals were no substitute for a man. A man, Adam, sinned, and a perfect man had to die because only a perfect man would be able to resurrect. The grave could not hold a man that was sinless, for the wages of sin is death, Romans 6 verse 23. Speaking about Christ Peter said, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it, Acts 2 verse 24. According to the scriptures, those sacrifices were temporary annual fixes that only covered sins until their sin would be completely dealt with. The children of Israel confessed their sins, recognized their penalty, and God the Father passed over their sins in anticipation of Christ's sacrifice which finally did put away the sins that are past Romans 3 verse 25. The problem was that since the blood of bulls and goats could not take away their sins, they would never be able to come before the Holy Father as required for the kingdom of priests. 5 Wherefore when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me, six in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. 7 Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. For this reason, that animal blood could never take away sins, when the Lord Jesus came into the world, he said, You did not want those sacrifices and offerings, but you have prepared a body for me, then said I, Lo, behold or look, I come, the entire book is written about me, to do your will. Notice that in Psalm 40 the words, but a body, were not in the verse. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened, 
burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yeah, thy law is within my heart, Psalms 40 verses 6 to 8. Asterisk notice in Psalm 40 verse 8 that Jesus Christ had the law in his heart. The new covenant was already in the heart of the sinless Son of God. The Lord Jesus understood that the Father required a human sacrifice, and that was the reason that the Father prepared a body for him. Jesus delighted to do the will of his Father, but it would not be as easy as it would have been for Isaac, because Israel did not sacrifice Christ in faith. Psalms 118 verse 27 Jesus understood that the entire the Bible was about him. God had prepared a body for his son to use to do the Father's will. God prepared a body through the seed line of Abraham, and then David and then to the vessel, Mary, and the timing, Galatians 4 verse 4, dot. Eight above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Nine then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. The above refers to what is written in Psalm 40, when he said, Sacrifices and offering, in Psalm 40 verse 6. God took no pleasure in the sacrifices of the blood of bulls and goats offered by the Old Covenant Law, Isaiah 1 verses 10 to 15. The writer of Hebrews under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost interprets and gives a commentary on the prophetic Psalm 40. His reasoning is very clear and logical. He guides them meticulously so they will know how to study God's word for themselves. God allowed those animal sacrifices to continue for his people's sake because they all pointed to Christ. But when the Holy Ghost then says, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. The Son realized that it was speaking of him, and that the will of his Father was for him to be the perfect pure sin sacrifice to pay for Adam and all mankind's sins. He delighted to do it. God's will was that by his blood, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, would take away the first covenant, Mosaic, so that he may establish the second, the new. Notice the new song in Psalm 40 verse 3 is like a new covenant. 10 by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. By the which will is God's will to establish the new covenant, we are sanctified, set apart as holy, through the offering of the body Jesus Christ once for all. The Godhead prepared a perfect human body so the Son, Luke 1 verse 35, John 1 verse 14, could pay for the sins of his people and be the perfect substitute blood sacrifice not only so they could be sanctified by faith from their individual sins but also for the nation's transgression of the old covenant Deuteronomy 32 verses 17 to 21. It was the Father's will that the Son would come into the world to deal with sin once for all so he could make a new covenant. Jesus Christ heroically accomplished that once for all sacrifice. By the offering of the body of Christ on the altar or cross, the Hebrew believers are completely sanctified once for all. The word once occurs eleven times in Hebrews. Eleven and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins, twelve but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, thirteen from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Fourteen for by one offering he hath perfected for ever them that are sanctified. Every priest stands daily continually ministering and offering over and over again often the same sacrifices that could never take away sins. These repeated offerings, sometimes of the same animals, can never take away sins. For all eternity God would not be satisfied by animal sacrifices. There was no chair in the sanctuary because the priests could never sit down since their work was never finished. But this man Jesus Christ sat down because his sacrifice satisfied the justice of God totally making reconciliation, perfect fellowship with God possible for us. But this man a man had to die in man's and Adam's place, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice himself in that body for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God because his work was done, from then on waiting fully expecting that his enemies be made his footstool, Psalms 110 verse 1. The Lord is waiting to see who believes who he is, the Son of God, and what he has done and died on the cross to pay for man's sins with his own blood so they can have his spirit, and who does not believe. Those who do not believe, especially among the Jews who only have four hundred and ninety years to become his priests, are his enemies, 
and they will be his footstool, be in subjection to him. The Lord has been sitting at the Father's right hand, and been long-suffering patiently waiting, for nearly two thousand years, so more people can be saved in mystery and prophecy before he comes to judge his unbelieving enemies, 2 Peter 3 verses 15 and 16. Dot. 15 Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, 16 This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, 17, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. How was the Holy Ghost a witness for the Hebrews? The Holy Ghost witnesses to believers by giving them a spiritual understanding of his word, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 16. What the Holy Ghost said before in Jeremiah, and earlier in Hebrews 8, is a witness to us, Hebrews. God confirms that he intends to replace the old covenant with this new covenant, Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34. After those days, refers to after the tribulation. When Christ returns then he will set up his kingdom, and implement the new covenant, 928. They will then be able to keep his law perfectly, and be his kingdom of priests to evangelize the Gentiles, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6, Matt 28 colon 20. With his laws in their mind and hearts, they will not sin any more. As the Holy Ghost said in Jeremiah, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more, 8 12, 10 17, Jeremiah 31 verse 34. Since God will not remember the individual and national sins of Israel any more when the new covenant is in effect, neither should they. Their conscience will be clear. He will equip them to keep his laws. God will make his nation out of the believing remnant that did believe in Jesus. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, Luke 12 verse 32. 18 Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. This is the main point. Now where there is remission, total forgiveness and complete removal of the penalty of sins, there is no longer a need or requirement for any more offerings for sins of any kind. The payment is finished and done. For by one offering he hath perfected for ever them that are sanctified, now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin, 10 14, 18. This is an incentive to endure through the tribulation. Still, the writer takes nothing for granted, and will shortly issue one more stern warning. 19 Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, 20 by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, 21 And having an high priest over the house of God, 22 Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. They who are destined to be a kingdom of priests, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6, have such a high priest that has blazed the way into the presence of the Father for them, him being both their high priest and their blood sacrifice. Having therefore total and complete forgiveness by the blood of Jesus, fellow believers, we have boldness to enter into the holiest of all in heaven and come before God the Father by the blood of Jesus. The way to come before him is no longer limited or restricted but open. Christ reconciled the believers so now they can draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith, and have fellowship with him. Their hearts have been sprinkled with his blood and pure water, Ezekiel 36 verses 24 to 28. Access to have fellowship with the Father is through the Son. The new and living way, is the new covenant by his blood which allows them to draw nigh or near to God, come into his presence as his priests. Jesus Christ has consecrated the way for us, Hebrews, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. To get into the holiest of all they need to go through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. The way to the Father is through the Son, John 14 verses 9 and 10. They will have his law in their living minds, and their living hearts, and his spirit in them, and they will think like him, Psalms 40 verse 8. Adam named the animals just what God would have named them. The Lord Jesus himself provided the new and living way, the new covenant, entrance to the Father. The first thing that happened as the Son of God died on Calvary was that the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, Matt, 27, 51. Only God could have had that thick veil torn like that. Since we, Hebrews, have such a perfect high priest of the house of God, believing Israel, 
Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, absolute confidence of faith. Since the Son completely dealt with sin, they can come boldly to the throne of God. The way is now open and unhindered. They are invited to come into the very presence of the Father having their hearts sprinkled with his blood and cleared from an evil conscience, fear of damnation, and their bodies washed clean with pure water, Ezekiel 36 verses 24 to 28. Paul said that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father for us in the body of Christ, too. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also mocketh intercession for us, Romans 8 verse 34. He ever liveth to make intercession for Israel, and currently he is interceding for us, and working spiritually in us and others to help us. The Hebrews are washed by his blood. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, Revelation 1 verse 5. With his spirit and their redeemed souls in their new glorified bodies, they will be totally purged from sin. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean, from all your filthiness, and from all your idols, will I cleanse you, Ezekiel 36 verse 25. They can be born again individually now, by believing in their priest King Jesus Christ, and obeying by being water baptized, Acts 2 verse 38, Mark 16 verse 16. Water baptism demonstrated faith, and separated the believers from the unbelievers. Why was Jesus Christ baptized? There are four reasons why Jesus was baptized, 1. To fulfill the Old Testament ceremonial washing as the high priest, Matt, 3.15, 2. To be manifest as Israel's Messiah, John 1 verses 29 to 34, Luke 3 verses 21 and 22. 3. To identify himself with the believing remnant of Jewish believers, the little flock, who were also being water baptized as a kingdom of priests. Acts 2 verse 38, and 4. To distinguish the believers from the unbelievers, Matt, 3 colon 7. Water baptism was required for Israel, but it is not for the body of Christ, and has nothing to do with our group. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. Our baptism is spiritual, dry, and waterless into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, Ephesians 4 verse 5. Dot. 23 Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised winky face. 24 And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, 25 Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. The writer includes himself with them, he is also part of the little flock, the believing remnant, Peter's group. He said let us hold fast, believe the truth, the profession of our faith without wavering, his fidelity is certain. Their profession of faith is what the writer of Hebrews has been telling them about Christ, the Son of the living God. Furthermore, the Son of God is their high priest king, who was also the perfect blood sacrifice that gained them the new covenant with his blood. They cannot waver they must hold on to the faith to the end of their lives or to the end of the tribulation. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, Matt, 2400 hours 13. Israel is saved by faith, but they are required to do works to prove their faith like being water baptized and by avoiding the mark of the beast. This mark will be instigated by Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation. The writer makes it very clear that they cannot say, since I trusted in Messiah, I can take the mark of the beast. The wickedness on the earth and the dreadfulness of God's plagues will be unimaginably horrible. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. All believers will need to join the little flock. It is a sin not to identify with the believing remnant and join the unbelievers, and become his enemy, which he is returning to destroy. It is crucial for them to gather together to encourage and warn one another to stay faithful and provoke, incite, stir, trigger, activate, prompt each other to love God and others and to do good works, deeds. They should consider each other to make sure they share their faith and food supplies or starve together, that is love in action. Good works is caring for one another and sharing the truth about Jesus their Messiah and helping others to get into the kingdom. They are not to forsake or neglect to continue to assemble with other little flock believers, as is the custom of some, because they are afraid to be identified with that group of outcasts. The unbelievers will say they are hindering the unity of the whole world. 
By studying the Word of God, they can exhort, warn, admonish, and encourage other believers to find safety, love, and support to do good works under the watchful care of the little flock. They should join together and affiliate with one another. But exhorting, warning each other in the little flock of the penalty of unbelief, one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, the second coming of Christ, drawing closer. Asterisk notice that the writer knows that the kingdom is postponed, he writes, as you see, not as we see. God knows that the ever-intensifying signs and chastening judgments will get Israel's attention and many Jews will believe, and be saved out of Antichrist's false religion in Jerusalem. Especially when Antichrist set up the abomination of desolation, his image in the temple at Jerusalem. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains, Mark 13 verse 14. What is the mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth? It is the worship of the son of perdition, Satan incarnate in Antichrist, but it is also the vain religion of Jerusalem's false apostate Jews, the proud, Psalms 40 verse 4 that do not believe Jesus their king priest offered himself as the blood sacrifice. By rejecting the Son of God's sacrifice, they are committing the ultimate idolatry, Revelation 17 verse 18. They will share all things in common again since the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Acts 2 44, for 32. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shut taith up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth, 1 John 3 verses 17 and 18. They are to be doers of the word, and not hearers only, James 1 verse 22. James said if someone does not take care of a brother or sister believer in the tribulation that is naked and destitute of daily food, that their faith is dead, James 2 verses 14 to 17. Then James asked them were not both Abraham, a Jew, and Rahab, a Gentile, justified, declared righteous, by works. Then James adds that faith without works is dead just like the body without the spirit is dead, James 2 verses 18 to 26. If Israel wanted to be blessed by God, she had to do works by faith, James 2 verses 14 to 26. The Jews that refuse to assemble with the believers in Israel will experience his vengeance at his return. Christ will return and gather the believers into the kingdom, but he will cast out the unbelievers. John the Baptist was a Levite priest that did not preach in the apostate temple, but in the wilderness. He was the forerunner that introduced Jesus Christ to the believers in Israel. John the Baptist was calling Israel away from the apostate satanic religious system into the wilderness, and out from under the fifth course of chastisement, Leviticus 26 verses 27-39. The believing Jews were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins, Matt, 3 colon 6, Leviticus 26 verses 40 to 46. Several of the apostles of Jesus had first been converts of John the Baptist, John 1 verse 30. The Hebrews should continue to assemble outside the temple in Jerusalem. It is a call to come out of that apostate, wicked, rebellious nation. To leave the vain religious system and trust Jesus as their Lord and Christ but they need to be careful that they are not taken in by a false prophet or false messiah there, that tries to appear as if they are fulfilling prophecy. This will be deception. Remember that John the Baptist refused to be called that prophet, John 1 verses 21 and 25, Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 to 19, Acts 3 verses 22 and 23. Antichrist will try to apply these verses to himself. He will ascend to power, 2 Thess. 2 8-12, he will be the greatest world leader Satan has ever put on this earth. King David was humble, but King Nebuchadnezzar's power went to his head, and God had to humble him until seven years had passed, and he acknowledged that God was the Lord over all the earth, Dan 5:21. Antichrist will be a Jew that does not regard the God of his fathers and is connected with Assyria, Deuteronomy 17 verses 14 and 15, Isaiah 10 verses 5 and 24. Dan 11 36, 37. He will come in peaceably by flatteries, but be a vile person, Dan 11 colon 21 24. Under his leadership, he will allow unbelieving Israel to rebuild their temple. 
The two witnesses will be calling believing Israel to come out of the old system into the new, Revelation 11 verses 3 to 12. Antichrist will kill the two, but after three and a half days they will resurrect, and then be caught up to heaven. Peter let the remnant know that the unbelieving city of Jerusalem under Antichrist will be like Babylon of old, 1 Peter 5 verse 13. It is also called Sodom and Egypt, Revelation 11 verse 8. God will not be in the temple, and the 144,000 mid-trib, plus the two witnesses, will be preaching against animal sacrifices at the resumption of Israel's program. The two witnesses have the power to stop the rain, Revelation 11 verse 6. Hebrews is warning the little flock not to participate in animal sacrifices. Antichrist will die and resurrect, and the majority of the people will believe that he is Christ, Revelation 11 verses 7 and 8, 13 colon 1, 2. It is at this time that Satan enters Antichrist, just like he did Judas, Luke 22 verse 3. At that point of the seven-year tribulation, he became the son of perdition, just like Judas did, John 17 verse 12. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. The unholy trinity will be the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the dragon, Revelation 16 verse 13. There will be ten kings that work with Antichrist, Psalms 83 verses 1 to 8, Dan 7 24, Revelation 17 verse 12. The second three and a half years of the tribulation is called the Great Tribulation, Matt, 2400 hours 21. Antichrist will want to exterminate all the faithful remnant, who will know that it is a lie, that he is not the Messiah God. The true believers that read the Bible will know that he is a fraud from the moment he signs the agreement. Even their family members will deliver the believers in Christ to be beheaded by Antichrist, Matt, 10 colon 16 dash 22, Revelation 20 verse 4. Antichrist's persecution of God's people will be relentless in an attempt to wipe them from the face of the earth, Dan 7:25. The believers that are killed and tortured will ask how long it will be before the Lord avenges them, Revelation 6 verses 9 to 11. Hebrews is calling the believers away from the old religious system. All believers need to join the little flock. Antichrist will be under the false assumption that he is orchestrating the events. Christ will return at the battle of Armageddon, and that evil unbelieving generation will be consumed by the sword of his mouth, Zechariah 14 verse 16. Revelation 16 verses 12 to 21, 21 15, 21. Christ will judge the Jewish unbelievers and cast them into hell for refusing to break away from the wicked, apostate Israel. There is an unspecified period of time or gap between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. How long will the gap be? We don't know, but it is probably less than 20 years. Daniel 11 verses 5 to 20 speaks of Antichrist as one of the kings of the north that battle at least two different kings of the south, Egypt. The Lord said that there would be wars and rumors of wars and all these are the beginning of sorrows, Matt, 24,6-8. Who the believers in the body of Christ are will be revealed at the rapture before that wicked Antichrist is revealed, 2 Thess, 2 colon 1, 6 to 8, dot. 26 For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, 27 But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. What does it mean to sin willfully? It is letting go of the truth in unbelief. To sin willfully is also to stop believing what God said in his word particularly in Hebrews about their high priest and his sacrifice. To sin willfully is to join the unbelieving Jews that have made a deal with Antichrist to be allowed to offer animal sacrifices in the temple. They should not think that offering an animal sacrifice would commend them to God after his son has been the perfectly satisfying sacrifice. To take the mark of the beast so they can eat is also to sin willfully. Many of their sins can be forgiven if they confess them to one another and pray for each other James 5 verse 16. But taking the mark is a sin unto death, an unpardonable sin, so there is no longer any point to pray for him. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not.
And we know that we are of God, and the whole world leeth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen, 1 John 5 verses 16 to 21. What the writer said should scare them for their own good and make them shiver in their shoes so that they would rather be willing to starve to death than take the mark of the beast. By inspiration, the writer solemnly warns them sternly that if they sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. There is no other sacrifice for sin than the one Jesus Christ has done. Believe the sacrifice of Jesus Christ because there is no other sacrifice for sins. Furthermore, this is the last chance to be his priest and to have eternal life in the kingdom. If they sin willfully all that remains for them as his enemies will be looking forward of their souls to a certain, fearful looking for judgment, at his second coming, and fiery indignation, God will be indignant that they rejected his son, which shall devour the adversaries, he would consider them among his adversaries and consume them at his return. But he will come to rescue the poor and meek also called the poor and needy, and the daughter of Zion, and the woman in the Bible which are the believing remnant. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Isaiah 11 verse 4. One of his many weapons is a plague. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem, their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Zechariah 14 verse 12. The seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials are plagues, and so is the plague of giant hailstones at the battle of Armageddon, Revelation 16 verses 16 and 21. There are two Israels, the unbelieving and the believing. On Pentecost, Peter preached, Save yourselves from this untoward generation, Acts 2 verse 40. The generation that is going in the wrong direction. One group received God's instructions and one did not. Get out of the group that is not moving toward eternal life, into the group that is going to be in the kingdom. The kingdom of God was taken away from the apostate nation and given to the little flock, Matthew 21 verse 43, Luke 12 verse 32. For if they sin willfully and join with the apostate vain religion in Jerusalem, who still offer animal blood, which is an insult to the Father God after his son shed his blood for them as their once for all sacrifice, or if they take the mark of the beast then there remains no more sacrifice for their sins. If they take the mark of the beast, then they will certainly be eternally damned. The knowledge of the truth for the Hebrews is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, their High Priest, and King, the once for all blood payment for sins, and no more offering is needed, and the believers will receive the new covenant when he returns. A Jew needed to repent and be water baptized on an individual basis to leave the generation of vipers and become part of the believing remnant. The knowledge of the truth for Israel, 1026, is different from the knowledge of the truth for the body of Christ. The knowledge of the truth for the body of Christ is to recognize the distinctive ministry Christ gave to Paul. Christ's ministry through Paul is to form the body of Christ during the dispensation of the grace of God to live in the heavenly places, Romans 11 verse 13, Ephesians 1 verses 9 and 10, 2 colon 6, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Christ's ministry through Peter is to make them a kingdom of priests, 1 Peter 2 verse 9. The gospel of Christ is Christ's death for our sins, burial, and resurrection. While the gospel of the kingdom is that Jesus of Nazareth, who came the first time, is Israel's Messiah. We must be rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. This means to divide the truth Christ gave to us through Paul and Romans to Philemon, from the rest of scripture, 2 Timothy 2 verse 7. The Bible is laid out prophecy mystery prophecy. If we take out the mystery, we are left with only prophecy. In Hebrews, they are learning about the cross of Christ in relationship to them. 28 He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses, 29 Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. He that despised a hated and counted as unworthy the law of Moses died without pity 
or mercy upon the evidence of two or three witnesses, Deuteronomy 17 verse 6. How much more severe punishment do you suppose he will be judged to deserve who has spurned and thus trampled underfoot the Son of God? He has considered the new covenant in his blood by which he was consecrated as common and unholy, and thus profane it and insulted and outraged the Holy Spirit who imparts such grace. There are three rebellious rejections of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost mentioned. 1. Trodden underfoot the Son of God, alludes once again to the parable of the sower. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, stepped on and ignored, and the fowls of the air devoured it the devils took it away, Luke 8 verse 5. Remember that only the hearts that have the good soil will make it into the kingdom, one out of four. It is an insult to God the Father to say that his son's blood sacrifice was not enough. 2. Hath counted the blood of the covenant, the son's blood of the new covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, that set those that believe apart for God, an unholy thing, as something that is profane like the blood of a common criminal. 3. Hath done despite, treated with extreme malice, unto the spirit of grace, another chance of eternal life by the words spoken in his word, or through the little flock believers, by trampling under their feet as worthless, the blood of the Son of God. To offer an animal sacrifice for sin after Christ had offered himself and purged their sins on Calvary would be an insult to God. To despise the Holy Ghost as was done at the stoning of Stephen. When Stephen said that God does not live in a temple made with hands, he was trying to get them away from the vain religious system in Jerusalem and to come to God through Jesus Christ. Believers will need to flee from Judea, southern Israel, when they see Antichrist sit in the temple in the middle of the tribulation. Jesus Christ warned, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes, Matt, 24,15-18. The Lord Jesus will protect the believers in Judea in the wilderness, but believing Jews living elsewhere will be persecuted, Isaiah 26 verse 20, dot. 30 For we know him that hath said, Vengeance Belangeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. 31 It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The writer quotes from the Song of Moses, which every Jew should have memorized, which describe God's fury against his adversaries that do not believe him. To me Belangeth vengeance and recompense, their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants, pay them back for what they have done to his servants the believing remnant, when he seeth that their power is gone, and there is none shut up, or left Deuteronomy 32 verses 35 and 36. The Lord Jesus will avenge himself and judge those who reject him and persecute his followers, Psalms 50 verses 5 to 7. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me, I kill, and I make alive, I wound, and I heal, neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven, and say, I live forever. If I whip my glittering sword, and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies, and will reward them that hate me, Deuteronomy 32 verses 39 to 41. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a fearful thing to be caught by the hands of the living God when you have refused to believe in spite of hearing about who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. The wrath of God is his anger against sin and unbelief. God has more to say about what he will do to his enemies in the rest of the Song of Moses. God has given everyone fair warning in his one instruction book to them, the Bible. Jesus Christ is the lawgiver and when he comes, he will save his believing Israel but destroy the unbelieving in Israel. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us, Isaiah 33 verse 22. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy, who art thou that judgest another? James 4 verse 12. God will save those who believed, and let him into their hearts. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me Revelation 3 verse 20. 
But those who judge the little flock in Jerusalem and cast them out saying, Let the Lord be glorified, will have it all wrong in their self-righteous ways, because they are his and the true believer's enemies. It will not go well for his enemies in that city when the judge that stood before the door comes to them in vengeance, James 5 verse 9. Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word, your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. A voice of noise from the city Jerusalem, a voice from the temple of apostate temple, a voice of the Lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies, Isaiah 66 verses 5 and 6. Dot. 32 But call to remembrance the former days, in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, 33 partly, whilst ye were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly, whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. Again, the writer is aware that he is writing to those who will be alive in the future generation that has to endure Jacob's trouble, the tribulation, Jeremiah 30 verse 7. By referring to the former days, when they were illuminated by the Holy Ghost on Pentecost, the writer connects the two groups as being the same group, Christ's earthly followers in the first part of Acts with his followers that are going through the tribulation. The former days are when the twelve, Stephen, and other disciples were shamefully treated by the unbelieving Jews. Members of the little flock were called before the council of the Sanhedrin to witness to the religious leaders three times. First Peter, John and the lame men, then Peter and the eleven, and lastly Stephen, Acts for verses 15 to 18, 5, 17, 18, 6, 15. In early Acts, many endured a great fight of affliction, at the hands of Saul of Tarsus, Acts 8, 1, 9, 1, 11, 19, 26, 11. The tribulation saints belong to the same group that began in the four gospels, and that will inherit the earth. Recall the former days, the years following Christ's ascension, in which after they believed and received the Holy Ghost, they were enlightened. The little flock was put on hold in Acts 15. Peter, the eleven, and the other followers of Christ's earthly ministry endured a time of intense persecution. Partly while they were made a gazing stock, a public spectacle both by reproaches and afflictions, disapproval of their faith and sufferings, and partly because they became companions with other believers who were also publicly tormented and accused. They were persecuted for being companions with the believing remnant that was persecuted. The believers were persecuted by the unbelieving religious leaders for associating with the tribulation saints. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, Mark 13 verse 13. The Jews that turned to Christ in the first century were generally guaranteed persecution and rejection from their family and friends. Many will lose their jobs and homes. Because the leaders of Israel were ignorant that Jesus really was their Messiah, although they knew they killed Jesus the men, they did not know they killed the Son of God, as Peter mentioned in Acts 3 verse 17. The Lord had asked the Father to grant Israel one more year extension of mercy by the Holy Ghost to believe in him, Luke 13 verses 6 to 9, 23 34. During that year Peter and the eleven apostles and his other followers that were filled with the Holy Ghost clearly communicated that Jesus was their Messiah. But the religious leaders responded by persecuting them. At the end of the year, they bit Stephen, Psalms 37 verse 12, Acts 7 verse 54, and stoned him to death with their own hands in their final rejection of the Son to rule over them. The nation of Israel blasphemed the Holy Ghost by not believing the renewed offer of the kingdom by faith in that Jesus really was the Holy One, Matt 12 31, 32, Acts 2 21, 3 14. The day of the Lord's kingdom was conditioned on Israel's response. The Lord is looking for those who believe with a genuine, humble, and contrite spirit, PSA, 34 colon 18, 51 colon 17, ISA, 57 colon 17, 66 colon 2. Therefore, also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil, Joel 3 verses 12 and 13. The religious leaders of Israel denied him after it was clear that Jesus really was the Messiah. They blasphemed the Holy Ghost, and the nation fell spiritually from their exalted honored position above the Gentiles, Romans 11 verses 11 and 12. But the little flock, Peter's group, 
continued growing until they were put on hold in Acts 15 slash Galatians 2. The nation of Israel fell, but after the rapture, God will make his nation of honor out of the believing remnant that did not fall. After the stoning of Stephen, the little flock was severely persecuted and scattered especially by Saul of Tarsus, who wanted to wipe them off the earth. After Jesus Christ saved Saul on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, Christ began a new ministry to all people through him. Saul was called by his Roman name Paul, the Apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, dot. 34 For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Now the writer is speaking to the believing remnant that was alive when the letter was written during Acts. The writer was one of the persecuted believers' little flocks that they were companions with. For you had compassion on me while I was in prison, the writer was known by the recipients of the letter which helped him while he was in jail. You took cheerfully the plundering of your belongings and the confiscation of your property, because you know in yourselves that you have a better and everlasting possession in heaven. His companions that revealed themselves by helping him had their belongings confiscated for his sake. This is just what will happen in the tribulation. But the Lord Jesus will return from heaven to rescue the believing remnant and to wreak vengeance on the unbelieving persecutors. He will set up the kingdom on earth, duet. 1121, and they will be his kingdom of priests, as they were destined to be. God does not have priests during the dispensation of grace, he has ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20. We will explore some possible human writers of Hebrews in chapter 13. 35 Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Do not throw away therefore your confidence in Jesus Christ, because you will be greatly compensated for your enduring faithfulness when he returns. The Lord will come back and bring their reward in the kingdom with him. Leaders are to be servants, Matt, 20 25 28. Christ gave the parable of the talents to demonstrate that there are rewards at his return, Matt, 25 14 30. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be Revelation 22 verse 12, dot. 36 For ye have need of patience, that, after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For you Hebrews have need of steadfast patience and endurance, so that, after you have done the will of God, kept the faith, and shared it with others, you might receive the promise, the new covenant and eternal life in the kingdom. They need patience to do the will of God. God's will for Israel is to evangelize and minister to the Jews before his return so they can also be saved into the kingdom. The will of God is the original commission Christ gave to the little flock with the addition of his cross and resurrection, the information in Hebrews to Revelation. When did the twelve know about Christ's sacrifice for their sins? The Lord Jesus Christ told them in the upper room on the very day of his resurrection, Luke 24 verses 44 to 48. The Lord told the twelve apostles not to go to the Gentiles or half-breed Samaritans, because Israel needed to be saved first so she could be a kingdom of priests to save the Gentiles. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give, Matt, 10, 5-8. The Lord sent out his apostles saying, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves be ye therefore wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents, and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, Flee ye into another, for verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel, till the Son of Man become, Matt, 10 16-23. 
Jesus Christ said that they would not have finished evangelizing all the cities of Israel before his second coming. So what happened? Why had he not come back? Because the father interrupted prophecy and put the little flock on hold so he could insert the dispensation of grace and save the body of Christ to live in heaven. After the rapture Israel's judicial blindness will be removed, Romans 11 verse 25, and they will once again accept new converts into the believing remnant. 37 For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. For yet a little while is the seven-year tribulation, then he that shall come will come, and will not tarry or delay, but come quickly, Revelation 22 verse 20, just as prophesied. But I am poor and needy the little flock, yet the Lord thinks upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer, make no tarrying, O my God, Psalm 70 verse 5. Jesus said, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father, John 16 verse 16. After Christ's second coming, when they are a kingdom of priests, then they will fulfill the next phase of their commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen, Matt, 28, 19, 20. Today Jews and Gentiles are saved into the body of Christ by believing the gospel of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. Our commission is to be ambassadors for Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 verses 18 to 21. God knows that Israel will believe when they see their signs in the tribulation, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the sun and moon dark, etc., for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22, Psalm 74 verse 9. The tribulation saints will have sign gifts. And it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also, upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will shew wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call, Joel 2 verses 28 to 32. Those who believe that the name of Messiah is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, not Antichrist, will be saved. The believers will need to be water baptized. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe, in my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover, Mark 16 verses 15 to 18. Remember Peter healed the lame man in his name, Acts 3 verse 6. The Lord Jesus Christ will come and deliver the tribulation saints from the Gentile unbelievers and the unbelievers in Israel that oppress them. But those Gentile nations that bless believing Israel according to the Abrahamic covenant will be allowed to live, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3, Matt 25 colon 31 dash 40, dot. 38 Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now, during the tribulation, the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back my soul shall have no pleasure in him. This verse from Habakkuk 2 verse 4 is quoted four times in the Bible, Galatians 3 verse 11, Romans 1 verse 17, and here. The meaning is that a man shall live by faith in the words that God has given him. Those in mystery live by the words God has given them, and those in prophecy by the words God has given them. We are to understand scripture by rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. The words to the Hebrews are in all the Bible except for Paul's letter, although all scripture is profitable. Draw back from what? To draw back from believing Jesus Christ not only being their high priest and king, but also being a complete and perfect final sacrifice for their sins. If they draw back in unbelief from enduring in faith to the end of the tribulation, then they will not receive their salvation at the revelation of Jesus Christ, 
Acts 3 verses 19 to 21, and the new covenant in the kingdom. They will not be one of his priests. They need to live by faith in God's word to them. The believers will have their spiritual blindness lifted to God's truth. But they can lose their salvation if they draw back. They do not have eternal security like the body of Christ, Romans 8 verses 35 to 39. To draw back is to not trust God to take care of them, offering animal sacrifices when the Son has already paid with his own blood, worshipping Antichrist, and taking the mark of the beast so they can buy and sell. The writer quotes Habakkuk 2 verse 4. They are to live by faith in God's word to them. There will be intense Bible studies going on before and during the tribulation. There are many instructions to help guide them in the Bible, and David, and the daughter of Zion, are types of the remnant which believe. The poor and meek are the little flock. God has not come to call the self-righteous to repentance, but the meek. God has devoted a great deal of the Bible to helping the little flock to get through the tribulation. They need to live by faith that God will provide their daily bread. The believers will be praying the Our Father prayer of Matthew 6 verses 9 to 13, and Luke 11 verses 1 to 4, Thy kingdom come. Everything outside Paul's letters, Romans to Philemon, is the prophecy program. 39 But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. But we in the little flock are not of them that draw back from believing into perdition and damnation, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. The writer is confident that they will heed the stern warning he has given them for their own good. He wants the best for them. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Revelation 19 verse 11. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau through faith he kept the Passover. Chapter 11 Faith in the Tribulation, Looking for a Better Country 11.1-3 What Faith Is 11 colon 4 31 How Kingdom Saints of Old Obtained a Good Report by Faith 11 colon 32 38 Other Heroes of the Faith that Suffered Persecution Like Them 11 39 40 All Saints Saved During Prophecy Will Be Resurrected in the Kingdom This chapter has been called the Hall of Faith, and it is, but it is also more than that, it is practical instruction for the Tribulation Saints. They Seek a Physical Kingdom but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matt 6.33 The destiny for the Hebrews is to be a kingdom of priests. Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6 The Bible is divided into the Old Testament and the New Testament, but the Old Testament did not begin until Exodus 19, and the New Testament did not begin until after Christ died, at the end of each of the four Gospels. The Bible is an inexhaustible book. The more we study it the more we see, and the deeper our understanding becomes. Every verse in scripture is there for a reason and has a 1. Historical, 2. Doctrinal, and a 3. Practical application. What is the difference between the gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom is at hand, and the gospel of the circumcision? The gospel of the circumcision also includes Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for Israel's sins. Paul reminded Peter of what he had said at the Jerusalem Council, that a man is justified by his faith in the faith of Jesus, by what Christ has done by his faith, and not by the law. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I do not frustrate the grace of God by trying to be righteous on my own by keeping the law, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain, Galatians 2 verses 16 and 21. What is faith? What is it that Abel's sacrifice yet speaketh? How did Noah condemn the world? What did Cain do instead of obeying God's offer to correct his mistake? What is the better country in 1116 and the better thing in 1140? When will the Old Testament saints, such as Daniel, be resurrected? 11. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is something real that has substance. The word substance has the root sub under and stance stand. 
Faith is what stands under the evidence of things not seen. God said things in his word that we cannot see. Paul said, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. Faith stands on Bible verses. We are not to make a claim about what God says unless we have a Bible verse to back it up. Faith is believing the word of God. Faith is not a blind leap in the dark, but a conclusion of a soul that has been persuaded by the evidence to believe the facts from the heart. When someone is 99% sure, faith is that last 1%. We believe in God because we see evidence of a creator in creation. We do not argue with God, we believe what God said. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth Genesis 1 verse 1. The things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Even though they do not see the hope for kingdom on earth now, the kingdom saints have faith that God will establish a kingdom similar to what David and Solomon had in the future, just as God said. 2 For by it the elders obtained a good report. The writer will soon begin to list the elders, the kingdom saints of old, that by it faith obtained a good report that they pleased God. Paul also said the body of Christ hopes for the rapture, glorified bodies in heavenly places, which we cannot see, Romans 8 verses 23 to 25, dot. 3 Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen, were not made of things which do appear. There is a double meaning here, God framed the world's creation, and the world's dispensations, by the word of God. The things that are seen, were created out of nothing from the mind of God by the word of God. God thoughtfully created something out of nothing, he spoke heaven and earth into existence, Gen 1, Psalms 33 verses 6 to 9. The word of God has great power. I used to wonder what worlds meant in the following song. O Lord my God! When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, from the hymn How Great Thou Art by Stuart K. Hine. Now I understand that the worlds are dispensations. Asterisk notice how the writer also mentioned worlds 1 colon 2 in the very beginning of the letter. We cannot see the worlds or dispensations of God, but we know he has set boundaries around his dispensations according to his word. God decided on the various dispensations. A dispensation is God dispensing different instructions to men. God made divisions in how he dealt with mankind in different ways at different times. We cannot see God's dispensational boundaries. But we know that Christ's earthly ministry through Israel and Christ's heavenly ministry through the body of Christ are distinct and different. The dispensation of grace was framed by the appearing of Christ to Saul of Tarsus in Acts 9, and then Jesus Christ appearing at the rapture. Israel is to be priests in his kingdom on earth to the Gentiles in prophecy, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6, 1 Peter 2 verse 9, Revelation 5 verse 10. The body of Christ is to be his ambassadors, representing him to whichever sinner will believe the gospel of his salvation, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4, so they can live eternal in the heavens, 2 Corinthians 5 verses 1 and 20. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord, men shall call you the ministers of our God, ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves, Isaiah 61 verse 6. There is a dividing line at Christ's second coming between the old world and the new world to come, 2 to 5, a new country, the kingdom on earth, a new dispensation, a new economy, a new administration. The better country will be different when the restitution of all things after the curse is lifted, Acts 3 verse 21, than the world they are then living in. For by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. The writer now gives a series of examples of past heroes of faith to show what the faith mentioned in 1038 looks like. He will speak of a better country, the kingdom on earth ruled by the true king. The phrases by faith and through faith are repeated to emphasize the necessity of faith and gives examples of what others have done by faith. The kingdom saints are saved by faith but are to do works to prove their faith. Abel, a son of Adam, offered his best lamb as a sacrifice to God, Genesis 4 verses 1 to 16. Cain offered a bloodless sacrifice of the best of his produce. Abel's sacrifice was more excellent than Cain's because he obeyed what God said. God testified of Abel's gifts, plural, 
his faith, and his blood sacrifice. God accepted Abel's sacrifice and declared him to be righteous, but God did not accept Cain's offering. Cain offered what he thought would please God, not what God said would please him. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin leath at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him, Genesis 4 verses 5 to 7. God gave Cain another chance to correct his mistake and go and offer a blood sacrifice. What did Cain do instead of obeying God's offer to correct his mistake? Cain just got mad and killed his brother Abel. Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him, Jan for colon 8b. Afterward the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood creeth unto me from the ground, Genesis 4 verses 9 and 10. What is it that Abel's sacrifice yet speaketh? His sacrifice says that blood is necessary for forgiveness of sins, and not only that but whoso sheddeth man's blood, by men shall his blood be shed, Genesis 9 verse 6. Abel's blood is still crying out to God that he was righteous by faith, and for God to execute justice. Abel's blood still speaks because it is recorded in God's eternal word for all to read. Abel's faithfulness is still testifying of God to others and reaping Abel's rewards in the eternal kingdom. Apostle John warns them that the children of the devil are righteous in their own eyes, but true righteousness is to do what God asks. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous, 1 John 3 verse 12. They cannot say, I did it my way. No, it has to be God's way, and by faith in his word. The Hebrews have been offered a more excellent sacrifice the Son Jesus Christ. For them to turn down God's provision for salvation is to go the way of Cain. Woe unto them! For they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor, Jude 1 verse 11. Dot. 5 By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. Enoch, a kingdom on earth saint, was translated to heaven. The body of Christ will also be transported to heaven. Many in Israel will believe in that day, when they realize that God has caught up the body of Christ to heaven, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17. Paul spoke about Israel having faith at Christ's second coming partially because God raptured us as he said he would who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed, in that day, 2 Thessalonians 1 verses 9 and 10. Jude said, way back then, that Enoch prophesied about Christ's second coming to execute judgment on the ungodly unbelievers. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints' angels, to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, Jude 1 verses 14 and 15. Enoch walked with God, and God took him up to him in heaven, Genesis 5 verses 21 to 24. God translated Enoch because his faith pleased God. Apostle John was caught up Revelation for verse 1, so he could write the book of Revelation. During the tribulation, the 144,000 and the two witnesses will be translated into heaven, Rev 11 12, 14 colon 1. Dot. 6 But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is required to please God. We must believe God exists even though we cannot see him. Those who diligently seek him are rewarded by finding him. His word is everything mankind needs to know. Only believers are saved. God wants to be found. Sinners first need to be saved from their sins by trusting him. 
Righteousness is received by faith in what God said to the person he saw speaking to. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matt 6.33 When they seek to believe the true Messiah that came in the flesh and died on the cross, then they receive his righteousness, and all the physical blessings can be added unto them. God speaks of rewards upon his return, such as job assignments in the kingdom, eternal life, glorified bodies, and his spirit in them. The parable of the ten talents describes some rewards. It did not go well for the servant that hid the talent he received. They were to share the gospel of the kingdom with others. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants, and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several a distinct ability, and straightway took his journey. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me two talents, behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed, and I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth, lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matt 25 colon 14, 15, 22 to 26, 28 to 30. Dot. 7 By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Things not seen as yet, no one had seen rain before God sent it, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground, Gen 2 colon 5 b 6. When Noah found out that the Lord was going to bring a flood over the whole earth to destroy every man and beast, he was afraid and obeyed everything God said. He prepared an ark for the physical, saving of his house, family, Gen 6 colon 1 9 colon 17. Noah was already saved. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis 6 verse 8. Noah inherited the Lord's righteousness by faith. They should prepare in the tribulation by selling their possessions so they can share, Luke 12 verse 33, and have all things in common, Acts 4 verse 32, with the other little flock members. How did Noah condemn the world? By the which is faith. Noah condemned the world because he and his family had faith, but the rest of the world did not. Noah endured into the new world, a type of kingdom. Likewise, the tribulation saints should prepare their and their families' hearts by obeying God's word to them, Luke 12 verses 47 and 48. God's word to them is not to build an ark. The Lord is the same at all times, but he has dispensed different instructions for salvation during different periods of time. God said different things for people to believe in different dispensations. It is interesting that Noah knew which were clean and unclean animals before Moses wrote it down in Leviticus chapter 11. Animal sacrifices began with God in the Garden of Eden and continued with Abel. Noah and his family were the only eight people left on the earth who had somehow escaped having their DNA corrupted by Satan and his angels. The only course of action that God had at that time was to destroy that wicked generation and start over with Noah. God sent a worldwide flood as judgment. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came, and destroyed them all, Luke 17 verses 26 and 27. Dot. 8 By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receiving for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. Abraham did not know what the country would be like when he just obeyed God and went out of his country, but his father and nephew wanted to come along. 
God will call those in Judea to come out to a place he will show them. Abraham believed that God would keep his promise to give him an inheritance, family, land, a great name, and make of him a nation, and that through him all the families of the earth could be blessed forever again. 12.1-9, Abraham obeyed and followed God to the land he wanted him to go to Genesis 17 verses 1-8. This fact should make some of the kingdom saints think about going where God tells them, the wilderness for those in Judea, Mark 13 verse 14, dot. 9 By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, 10 For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Abraham sojourned, stayed temporarily, in the land of promise, as if he were in a strange country, living in temporary tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs who received the same promise from God, the Abrahamic Covenant, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3, 26 colon 1 dash 5, 28 colon 13 dash 15. God called Abraham out of the idolatrous nation in Mesopotamia to be separated from them unto God, Deuteronomy 26 verse 5, Joshua 24 verse 2, Acts 7 verse 2. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country because it was the land, but it was not God's country yet. Abraham was looking for a city with foundations whose builder was God which would be his permanent home. The city of the great God and king was not there yet. Abraham knew that God wanted to live with men and have fellowship with him. For thus said the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited, I am the Lord, and there is none else, Isaiah 45 verse 18. The Lord plans to tabernacle with them. The tribulation saints should have the same goal of living in my father's house, the new Jerusalem which will have twelve foundations, John 14 verse 2, Revelation 21 verses 12 and 14. They should also look for that city. 11 Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Through faith Sarah received the strength to conceive, bear, and deliver a child after she was past the age of childbearing. Because Sarah determined that she could depend on what God said, the promised son was born, and a great nation of people came out of Abraham, Genesis 18 verses 1 to 15, 21 colon 1 8 dot. Twelve therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Sarah, Abraham, and baby Isaac are a picture of resurrection from the dead. God brought Sarah's womb that was past age back to life, and also Abraham who was as good as dead reproductively came back to life and Isaac was miraculously born. Because of Abraham's and Sarah's faith many descendants sprang life from the dead from them. Their seed will continue to multiply in eternity, Genesis 22 verses 16 and 17. The nation's population will grow in the kingdom after the curse on creation is lifted. 13 These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Faith is being persuaded. The descendants, the elders 11 colon 2, all the men and women that the writer just mentioned, all died having received the promises of eternal life in the better country, kingdom. The elders were persuaded that God would give them a land, and that he would resurrect them to life, in his future kingdom. They only saw these promises afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them. Since God had not established his kingdom yet, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims until they were in their home country. 14 For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. 15 And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. 16 But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. That say such things as this world is not my home. If their minds had been preoccupied with the country they came out from, they may have wanted to return. But now they desire to seek a better country, the kingdom of God on earth, and they are not going back to the country they came from. Ultimately, they came out of the sin-cursed world, Genesis 3 verse 17, Galatians 1 verse 4. 
Abraham came out of Mesopotamia, an idol-worshipping country, Acts 7 verse 2, Judd. 24 colon 2, the children of Israel came out of Egypt. Egypt is a type of the world that is apostate, unbelieving. They want the kingdom to come down to them, thy kingdom come, Matt, 610, while the body of Christ is looking to be caught up. God has prepared a city for them, the new Jerusalem on the new earth, Revelation 21 verses 1 and 2. Jesus told his followers, in my father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, John 14 verse 2. Since they have faith in God and want to be in God's country, the kingdom, with him, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. 17 By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, 18 of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall they seed be called, 19 accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Abraham, when his faith was tested, to see if he loved God more than his son, offered up Isaac. Isaac was his only begotten son of the promise of the future seed that would be the nation. Abraham counted on the fact that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Even though Isaac was not killed because the angel of the Lord stopped Abraham from doing so, in Abraham's and God's minds Isaac died and came back to life. Isaac resurrected figuratively, which also pictured his son's work on Calvary, Genesis 22 verses 7 to 14. To offer his son took real faith. Abraham and Isaac believed in the resurrection, and so did the sons of Korah, Psalms 49 verse 15. Dot. 20 By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Notice that Jacob is mentioned first because he received the double blessing of the firstborn. This birthright gave him a double portion in the eternal kingdom and a part in the seed line to Messiah. Isaac prophesied of things to come when he blessed his sons Jacob, Genesis 27 verses 27 to 29, and Esau, 27 colon 39, 40. Dot. 21 By faith Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph, and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. Jacob was given the name, Israel, at Penel, Genesis 32 verse 31, and needed to lean on his staff after the angel of the Lord dislocated his hip. Jacob blessed the sons of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh, Genesis 48 verse 17. Asterisk notice that Jacob prophesied as far back as Genesis, what would happen at Christ's return, Gen 49. Dot. 22 By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel, and gave commandment concerning his bones. Joseph believed that God would bring his people back from Egypt to the promised land just as God said. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for hundred years, and also, that nation, whom they shall serve, will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. Genesis 15 verses 13 and 14. Joseph received the double blessing instead of the firstborn Reuben, and will have two tribes in the kingdom, Ezekiel 48 verse 5. Joseph knew he would be resurrected, so he asked the children of Israel to carry his bones back with them so he would resurrect in Israel and not have to travel there in Genesis 50 verses 24 to 26. Dot. 23 By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. The parents of Moses, Amram and Jochebed, Exodus 6 verse 20, by faith hid baby Moses for three months. Baby Moses a goodly child, Exodus 2 verse 2, exceeding fair, Acts 7 verse 20, and in Hebrews he was a proper child. His parents feared God more than the king's commandment, Exodus 1 verse 16. The king was a type of Antichrist. During the tribulation, when the government's rules conflict with what God has told them they ought to obey God rather than men, Acts 5 verse 29. Some of the tribulation saints may have to hide their children. 24 By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, 25 Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, 26 Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. When Moses was grown, 
He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and said that Jochebed was his mother. He chose to suffer affliction with his people than to enjoy the pleasures of sin during his lifetime. Moses believed that suffering reproach for the sake of trusting in the God of Israel was better than the treasures in Egypt, and valued the reward of eternal life that he would receive. Money is not what counts, eternal life is. The writer is telling them to identify with the believing remnant and not be part of the vain religious unbelievers in Messiah, because greater riches await them in the kingdom. 27 By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, as seeing him who is invisible. 28 Through faith he kept the Passover, and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith Moses forsook Egypt, left Egypt behind him, and was not afraid of the anger of the king, for he persevered, as one who sees him who is invisible. Moses endured as seeing the invisible Lord. The king, Pharaoh, is a type of Antichrist. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood on the doorposts and over the door, to be sure that he, the Lord, Exodus 12 verse 29, who destroyed the firstborn men and animals of Egypt would not touch them with death. The Lord said, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you, when I smite the land of Egypt, Exodus 12 verse 13. God did not look to see who was inside, when he saw the blood, he passed over them. Likewise, when he sees Christ's blood on the believer, he does not look at our sins, no matter how evil, but passes over them. The Father has passed over them because of his Son's precious blood sacrifice. The tribulation saints should remember that Jesus Christ is the true Passover lamb that took away the sins of the world. They should forsake the vain religious system that is still offering animal sacrifices. They should not be afraid of Antichrist who can only kill the body, but not the soul, Matt, 10.28. Trust the one you cannot see, Christ Jesus, the Son of God. Chose to suffer for the word of God in the tribulation. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held, Revelation 6 verse 9. John spoke of their rewards and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, Rev 20 colon for B. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, Psalms 116 verse 15, dot. 29 By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians assaying to do were drowned. By faith Moses and all the Israelites crossed through the Red Sea on dry land, about eleven miles, but when the Egyptians attempted to do the same thing, they were drowned. Israel's Red Sea crossing was a rehearsal for the future. God will do a similar miracle like the Red Sea in the future. The Mount of Olives will split open, and they will flee from Antichrist in Jerusalem through that valley to the mountains. When they escape through the pass Jesus Christ will create for them when he cleaves a valley through the Mount of Olives those enemies, the forces of Antichrist, that chase after them may be killed if the mountain slams shut behind them. That day will be a long day as in the time of Joshua when the sun stood still, Zechariah 14 verses 4 to 7, Josh 10 13. The cloud that led them by day and by night will be repeated in the future, Isaiah 4 verses 1 to 6. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he will do what Joshua failed to do, he will completely take back the land from the enemy and bring in a true rest. 30 By faith the walls of Jericho fell down, after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after the Israelites shouted, having circled them for seven days. That strange war strategy took faith, and God may show them a strategy from his word that will take faith in the future. Antichrist's kingdom will fall quickly. The believing Israelites, by faith, will overcome Antichrist and apostate Jerusalem. 31 By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. Rahab had been a harlot, but when she heard that God's people escaped Pharaoh through the Red Sea, and were coming to Canaan, she believed in the one true God of Israel, and went into the flax linen making business. Rahab and her entire family were spared because she harbored and helped the Jewish spies with peace. God also blessed her to be in the lineage to Messiah, Matt, 1 5. 
Rahab is a type of Gentiles that will be saved during the tribulation for believing in Israel's God and harboring the believing Jews, feeding them, and caring for them in prison, according to the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3, Joel 3 verses 9 to 12, Matt 2400 hours 14, 25 colon 31 dash 40. They know salvation is of the Jews, John 4 verse 22. It may be that 153 Gentile nations will bless the Jews, which may be represented by the number of fish in the net that did not break, John 21 verse 11, dot. 32 And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, 33 who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, 34 quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. What more can the writer say about the people who had faith in God so he can help the tribulation saints? He does not have enough time to relate all the history of Israel, but he wants them to know what is embedded in their history that are clues from God to help them get through the future persecution in the tribulation, Matt 10 colon 6-23. Israel's prophesied kingdom will be even grander than her history, Jeremiah 16 verses 14 and 15. They can subdue the kingdom of Antichrist, work righteousness, obtain promises, stop the mouth of Satan's words, put out the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of their weakness they can be strong, Psalm 74 verse 21, Joel 3 verse 10, and grow brave in the fight, and make Satan's armies flee from them. They should cry out to the Lord. 35 women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection, 36 and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yet moreover of bonds and imprisonment, 37 they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, 38, of whom the world was not worthy they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Just as saints in the past have fought for God under adverse circumstances, so will they. Some may be blessed and receive their dead raised to life again. But those brought back to life will die again, unless they believe, and are raised up in glorified permanent bodies. They should endure suffering for the sake of a better resurrection. Many will suffer different kinds of persecutions, chains, imprisonment and death. Some will be stoned to death, beaten, killed, sawed in half, lured into giving in, and slaughtered by the sword, beheaded, Revelation 20 verse 4. Others may suffer cruel mocking and torture, even chains and imprisonment. They should not seek deliverance from being tortured by conceding and joining the enemy, so they might obtain a better resurrection, in a better country. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it Mark 8 verse 35. Others will be forced to live as outcasts in the rugged wilderness, impoverished, distressed, and persecuted, Revelation 2 verse 10. The world was and is not worthy of the faithful people that hide out in the desert, mountains, and caves, and have true faith in Jesus Christ and his word. 39 And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, 40 God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. All of the past saints just listed obtained a good report through faith, and God, the author, and the human writer of Hebrews, wants the readers to obtain a good report also. God's promises to Abraham will be fulfilled in the kingdom. The Old Testament saints have not yet received the promised better country, with God living with them, Genesis 13 verse 15. The Lord Jesus said they would sit down with him in the kingdom, Matt 8:11. What is the better thing? The better thing is eternal life in the better country, the kingdom. God has provided a better thing for us, that they would not be raised up and perfect without us, Hebrews. God has provided them with the Holy Ghost so they can endure to the end of the tribulation and receive the new covenant in the kingdom. They will be perfect and complete together, the tribulation saints receive their glorified bodies under the new covenant at the same time in the kingdom, at his second coming, Dan 12 colon 1, 2. When will the kingdom on earth saints be resurrected? All the kingdom saints will be resurrected at the same time in the better country, the kingdom on earth, and live with their king priest Jesus Christ. 
The kingdom saints consist of all the believers from Adam until Christ's second coming, excluding those who were saved to live in heaven under Paul's mystery ministry. Why did Jesus say that only his father knew when he would return, Matt, 2400 hours 36, 42, 25 colon 15, Mark 13 verses 32 and 33. It is because no one knows how long the gap of time is between the rapture of the body of Christ and when the Antichrist signs the seven-year covenant with Israel, Dan 9 colon 24-27. Antichrist will be an Assyrian Jew that the Lord Jesus Christ will destroy, Isaiah 10 verses 5 and 24, 25, 30 colon 31, 31 colon 8, Dan 11 37, Mike 5 colon 5, 6. Antichrist shall honor, a God whom his fathers knew not, Dan 11.38. In Daniel 11 verses 5 to 20 we learn that the gap may be many years long, because several kings will arise in the Middle East and numerous wars before the Antichrist comes on the scene. Antichrist comes to power and signs the seven-year covenant in Daniel 11 verse 21. Daniel 11 verse 22 is the actual start of the seven-year tribulation. We know three and a half years equals 42 months equals 1,260 days. A Hebrew month is 30 days, and 12 months in a year is 360 days. Seven years is 2,520 days. In Daniel 8 verse 14, we learn that Christ will return 2,300 days after the Antichrist has finished building the temple in 220 days, 2,520 minus 2,300 is 220. The apostate priests will be offering animal blood sacrifices and oblations the covenant is signed possibly in a tent until temple is finished. Christ returns in 2,300 days or 6.3 years to cleanse the idolatry. In the middle of the tribulation, Antichrist will make those sacrifices and oblations to cease and sets himself up in the temple as Christ. Paul wrote, so that he is God sitteth in the temple of God, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4. Daniel also mentions 1,290 days, which is 30 days more than the 1,260 days. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that mocketh desolate set up, there shall be a 1,290 days, Dan 12 11. Antichrist will defile the temple halfway mark of the seven years of tribulation, at 42 months, after signing of the covenant. Then 42 months later, Christ returns which is precisely seven years after the covenant is signed. There are 30 more days after his return before the first resurrection part of the resurrection first resurrection, which is in two stages 45 days apart. Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days, Dan 12:12. That is 1,335 days, which is 75 days more than the 1,260, and for the resurrection of the saints. Therefore the kingdom saints will most likely be resurrected 30 days after his return, and some 75 days after Jesus Christ returns, one and two and a half months after Christ's return. Christ will return exactly seven years after Antichrist signs the covenant with Israel. If all these dates are given why did Jesus say that only his father knew when he would return? No one knows how long the gap will be before Antichrist signs the covenant. But after he signs it the believing Jews will study the Bible and be able to use this information to establish the precise date of Christ's coming. Revelation speaks of 40 and 2 months, Revelation 11 verse 2, in several places. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days, one thousand two hundred and sixty days or forty-two months, Revelation 12 verse 6. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent three and a half years or forty-two months, Revelation 12 verse 14. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, Revelation 13 verses 4 and 5. Notice that there is no mention of blood in the resurrected bodies of the kingdom saints, or the heavenly saints, Ezekiel 37 verses 1 to 14, Ephesians 5 verse 30. 
Chapter 12 Endure chastening looking unto Jesus and warnings. 12 colon 1 dash for look to Jesus the perfect example, so you do not faint in your minds. 12 colon 5 dash 13, endure the Father's chastening as sons. 12 colon 14 dash 17 warning, help the weaker believer to not be like Esau. 12 colon 18 dash 24 you have not come to Mount Sinai, but Mount Shaun. 12 colon 25 dash 29 warning turn not away from him that speaketh from heaven. God has to send the prophesied seven-year tribulation upon Israel, but in his loving kindness, he interspersed the cross so the little flock can come to him. The body of Christ was also on the other side of the cross. Who are the little flock? The little flock, Luke 12 verse 32, includes believers of Israel from John the Baptist, all the converts from Christ's earthly ministry, all the converts from the twelve apostles in early Acts, and all the converts in the tribulation. When did the little flock know that Christ first had to die for their sins? The Lord Jesus Christ had told them during his earthly ministry, but they had not understood, Matt, 16 colon 21 dash 23, Mark 9 verses 31 and 32, Luke 9 verses 44 and 45, 18 colon 31 dash 34. However in the upper room on the day of his resurrection, Jesus Christ again explained his death for their sins to them, and this time they finally understood, Luke 24 verses 44 to 48. Christ continued to teach them and to prepare them for the tribulation in his post-resurrection ministry, spoken during his 40 days on earth, in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20, Acts 1. In early Acts, the little flock, redeemed Israel, preached the gospel of the kingdom, Acts 2 verse 38. The body of Christ believe in the gospel of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. Adam and Eve did not just eat some grapes, they disobeyed God and chose themselves over him. God had to show them and mankind for their own good that submission to him was best for them. We mourn that our sins made his sacrifice on Calvary necessary, and Israel will mourn that they crucified their high priest that offered himself as their sacrifice. What is the joy that was set before him? What is every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us? What is meant by lame? Why is God chastening the believing Jewish remnant? Why bring up Esau and the shaking in Haggai 2 verse 6? Who is the church of the firstborn? Is Ephesians 4 verses 8 to 10 where Christ took Abraham's bosom to heaven? Why does God let Satan live? Where is the Ark of the Covenant now? Twelve. One wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, to looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Chapter 11 is parenthetical, and the writer continues where he left off in chapter 10. They are compassed or surrounded by the people of faith in chapter 11, note the writer gives Christ as the ultimate example of enduring to the end. He also returns to the important subject of assembling together for the purpose of exhorting one another, and gives them further practical instructions. The Abrahamic covenant is everlasting, but the old covenant was temporary, and will be replaced by the better permanent new covenant. Since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, the people of faith in the past and in the tribulation, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily trips us up. What is every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us? The sin is unbelief which the writer has been warning them about in this letter, 3 12, 19, for colon 6, 11. Beset means besieged or befall as an enemy, unbelief is dangerous to all people, and an enemy that will keep them out of the kingdom. There is a temptation to backslide in unbelief and turn away from Jesus Christ and to draw back to perdition 1038. Their every weight is their fear and sorrow for having to go through affliction and persecution during the horrible tribulation. They may be tempted to have doubt and self-pity as they worry about the evil things happening to them. Self-pity leads to depression, heaviness and fear. The temptation to grumble and complain will be strong. 
therefore they are urged to look to Jesus, not to themselves. The sin is the temptation to not believe, and to take the mark will be strong. The tribulation saints will be tempted to take the mark of the beast so they can eat, but starvation and eternal life in the kingdom are better. The author uses the analogy of a racetrack runner, Proverbs 4 verse 12. They should lay these things aside and run with patience the race that is set before us. Life is a race to prepare for eternity in the new heaven and new earth. Their race at the moment is to make it through the tribulation and into the kingdom that is before them. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth, the land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yeah, and nothing shall escape them, Joel 2 verse 3. The kingdom is before them, but they must run the race with patience. Looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of your faith. Keep your eyes fixed on our high priest King Messiah, his coming is our finish line. He is their finest example of suffering, courage, and perseverance. He wrote the book on how to keep the faith to the end of his life, and he finished the story by resurrecting from the dead. He said about himself, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty, Revelation 1 verse 8. Isaiah wrote, Look unto me Jehovah God, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else, Isaiah 45 verse 22. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes, he will bring the new covenant with him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever Isaiah 59 verses 20 and 21. Jesus Christ bore the cross to Calvary, Latin for Golgotha, a mountain that looks like a skull. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand, and the other on the left, Luke 23 verse 33. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two others with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst, John 19 verses 17 and 18. He was the first to suffer and be glorified, 1 Peter 1 verse 11. He is the one who made it possible for every man to be redeemed. What is the joy that was set before him? Jesus finished his race for the J-O-Y that was set before him was ruling the kingdom on earth with his redeemed kingdom of priests, Psalms 142 verse 7. They are to be his agency to reclaim the earth under his authority. He despised the shame of being so cruelly treated by his nation that he came to save, but he still gladly bore the burden of their disgusting sins. The Lord Jesus knew they would have sorrow and likened it to a woman who suffers through childbirth. A woman when she is in travail hath sorrow, because her hour is come, but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish, for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. John 16 verses 21 and 22. A woman dreads the labor because the pains intensify and become longer, harder, and stronger, but she knows that in the end, she will give birth to a child. The tribulation will intensify like a woman's labor, they will be born again at his return in the kingdom, John 3 verse 7. The tribulation saints will also have to endure and despise some things, but just like the Lord Jesus, they should look beyond the tribulation to the joy they will have in the kingdom. Filling his mind with the joy of being in the kingdom, with his friends, helped the Lord Jesus to endure the cross. He was looking forward to enjoying being with the redeemed in his kingdom, when he sits on the throne as the rightful heir and king. For the time being, Jesus Christ is sitting in the place of honor, at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. If Christ can suffer crucifixion for them, they can suffer through the tribulation. As they run their race through the tribulation, they should keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, looking for his second coming for them at the finish line. The righteous will have their hearts fixed on Jesus Christ, and will not slip or trip, but will make it into the kingdom, Psalms 112 verse 9. Christ suffered and was exalted, and they will also be exalted. Peter said God will exalt you in due time, because after they suffered a while the tribulation, God will make them perfect, mature through suffering, Psalms 37 verse 34, 
1 Peter 5 verses 6 and 10. They will be exalted and have eternal life in the kingdom. 3 For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Sinners did evil things to him, and the little flock should consider, think about, his example so they are not tempted to faint in your minds under the evil that shall come upon all the earth. Notice that the battle is in the mind. Christ endured great contradictions of sinners, by focusing on all his friends that believed, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job, Moses, David, Daniel, etc., that would be saved and be resurrected like him in the kingdom if he paid for their sins. He was scorned, mocked, mistreated, and slandered by the ones he came to save, a reproach of men, and despised of the people, Psalms 22 verse 6. All they that see me laugh me to scorn, they shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him, let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him, Psalms 22 verses 7 and 8. There was none that could help him when he was on the cross, so he prayed to the Father, Psalms 22 verse 11. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round, bulls are associated with Baal or Satan worship. The apostate religious leaders of Israel were the followers of their father, John 8 verse 44. Dot. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. Satan is behind it all of Psalms 22 verse 13. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me, the Gentile soldiers watched him with callous curiosity, and gambled to see who would get his clothes. Psalms 22 verses 16 to 18. I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Psalms 142 verse 7. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him, all ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him, and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. He thought about the present congregation, and those that would believe in the future. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. It will seem as if God has temporarily hid his face from them during the tribulation. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. The little flock of followers are the meek shall inherit the earth. Matt 5 colon 5. Psalms 22 verses 22 to 26. The sinners were in desperate need of receiving his righteousness. Other passages speak of his life being prolonged, eternal, because God was satisfied with his sacrifice. Isaiah 53 verses 10 and 11. The Lord knew from scripture that he would be resurrected. Psalm 16 verse 10 and rule in the kingdom, Dan 2.44. The tribulation saints will also have to trust in God's word, and the promises, that they will be resurrected to live forever in his kingdom. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this, Psalms 22 verse 31. The tribulation saints will also be scorned, mocked, and mistreated by Satan-inspired men and women, but they can remember that Jesus Christ will repay their enemies. The Pharisees said his power was from Beelzebub, Satan, Matt, 1224. If they think about the Lord and what he endured, they can finish the race without fainting in the middle of it. The tribulation saints will suffer contradictions when the followers of Antichrist will think they are preventing the unity of the world religion, so they will want to kill them thinking they are serving God when they are serving Antichrist. In the tribulation, believers will be slandered, Psalms 50 verse 20. They have to decide to be single-minded, to endure to the end, and not give up. It will be a time that is more horrible than any the world has ever known. The evil days show who the upright are. They should not start to feel sorry for themselves. God has to send the prophesied seven-year tribulation upon Israel, but in his loving kindness, he interspersed the cross so they can come to him. When on earth, Christ called the second half, the Great Tribulation. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, Matt, 2400 hours 21. They said and did many evil things to him, yet he endured the cross and finished his race. Christ was faithful to him that appointed him. He was busy doing his father's business. 
He did the work his father gave him to do, John 20 verse 21. James warned about being double-minded and not sure about the truth in the Bible because those are the people who will not make it James 1 verse 8. In the tribulation, God will make a division between who belongs to Christ and who do not. They need to be wise and build their house upon the rock Jesus Christ, and not foolish and build their house upon the sand of Matt, 7 colon 24 dash 27 dot. For ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. It is as if he is saying you are passing out before you even have to suffer to the point of death, as they strive against not taking the mark. They have not yet resisted to the point of having to shed their blood as they battle against the sin of the unbelievers around them, but they may be required to resist unto blood and strive against sin, and be killed in the last half of the tribulation. In the first half of the tribulation, people are rejecting them because they follow Jesus Christ. Many will say you can no longer be my son. But they have to be ready when things get worse, they may have to be beheaded for refusing to take the mark. Many will become fatherless and widows, James 1 verse 27. God is trying to get the attention of any who will believe what he said in his word. So he can save as many as possible. It will be the Bible-believing people who trust that the Jesus Christ who came the first time is Israel's Messiah that will be saved. The Gentiles will need to bless the believers in Israel according to the Abrahamic covenant. The believers will know what is going on by reading and studying their Bibles dispensationally. Paul's writings were not to them, but God said some important things through him that the prophecy saints can learn from. Just like the people in mystery can learn from prophecy, even though it was not to them. Paul said, Put on the whole armor of God the entire word of God Ephesians 6 verse 11, and that all scripture is profitable 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. But it must be rightly divided, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. The main division in the Bible is between prophecy and mystery. 5 And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. 6 For whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. 7 If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? 8 But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards, and not sons. 9 Furthermore we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits, and live? 10 For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Have they forgotten that the Lord God spoke to them and admonished them as his sons in Proverbs? The Holy Ghost replaces weary in Proverbs 3 verses 11 and 12 with faint. God's judgments onto Israel were attempts to train her as a parent would lovingly discipline a disobedient child. The law proved that sinful men could never measure up to the holiness God wanted, Romans 3 verses 19 and 20. They are not to despise the chastening that they are receiving from the Lord. They are to look at the tribulation as chastening that is coming from the Lord for the purpose of making them partakers of His holiness. God the Father corrects every son that He has received as His, for His profit. A father is to spank his son betimes, immediately with a switch. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes, right away, Proverbs 13 verse 24. Older children can reason more than the younger. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell, Proverbs 23 verses 13 and 14. If you endure his chastening, then God dealeth with you as his sons, because he has given over the ones to their own lusts that are not his. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? All God's true sons are partakers of his chastisement. Why is God chastening the believing Jewish remnant? God is chastening and sending Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30 verse 7, for Israel's past and present idolatry, God is not angry with them individually. Now if you are exempt from correction and left without discipline, which all God's legitimate sons receive, then you are bastards and not sons. The unbelievers are not God's sons, God considers them bastards of your father the devil, John 8 verse 44. Besides, we have had fathers on earth who corrected us, and we honored them, 
shall we not much more obediently and willingly submit to the Father of Spirits and have life? They should show reverence to the Father of the Spirit of Men, 1223. They should subject themselves to their Father's chastening during the tribulation so they can live eternally. They should be happy that He is giving them an opportunity to have eternal life while they are purified and matured spiritually. Human fathers may chasten their sons for their own pleasure so that they will not annoy or embarrass them. They punished us for a little while in the way they saw fit, but He punishes us for our benefit, that we might be partakers of His holiness. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine, Leviticus 20 verse 26. The purpose of the law was to make Israel a nation that all the other nations would want to be like. So all the nations would want the God of Israel to be their God. The other nations would then say, There is a nation worth being like because they have Jehovah as their God. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? Deuteronomy 4 verse 7 Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth, Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty, for he mocketh sore, and bindeth up. He woundeth, and his hands make hold. Job 5 verses 17 and 18. They will be going through the refiner's fire. For thou, O God, hast proved us, thou hast tried us, as silver is tried. Psalm 66 verse 10. He is preparing his sons that will inherit the kingdom. 11 Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous, nevertheless, Afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. They should be happy that God is dealing with them as sons in a covenant relationship again. While the chastening, spanking, is going on it is not joyous, but grievous, nonetheless afterward they will experience the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them who are exercised thereby, trained by loving correction from the Lord for their profit. With his righteousness they can be at peace. God cares about them as sons again. They are no longer lo ami, Hosea 1 verse 9, not my people, Hosea 2 verse 23. God had interrupted their chastening, but now he has picked up where he left off in Acts 15, therefore the salvation opportunity into the little flock is continuing. Gentiles that believe that Jesus is Israel's Messiah, and bless the believing remnant will also be saved, Isaiah 1 verse 9. No chastening, spanking, seems pleasant but painful, nevertheless, Afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto those that have been corrected that way. After they have endured through the terrible, terrifying, tribulation they will experience the peaceable joy that someone cleansed and corrected by a spanking has. They will be better equipped to serve him as his priests in the kingdom. During the kingdom, they will be able to apply what they learn in the tribulation such as the importance of swift punishment for disobedience. Christ will rule with a rod of iron, Rev 2.27, 12 colon 5, 19, 15. In the past, Israel failed to utterly destroy the sinful inhabitants that occupied the promised land, Deuteronomy 12 verse 2, 1 Samuel 15 verse 9, as God told them. The result was a long history of not only war in the land that continued until Jesus came, but also idolatry, which was a snare, Psalms 106 verses 34 to 36. Jesus has already perfectly run the race they are preparing to run and finished. When they are going through the worst persecution, they can remember what Jesus has done for them. Surely, he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed, Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5. Some had thought that God punished Jesus, but he was punished in their place for their wrong. The father chastened his son instead of them. He took the stripes they deserved so they could have peace and be healed. The father bruised him for their sakes, he took out his anger on him instead of them. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief, ISA, 53 10 a. God is angry at the nation that failed to reverence him, and went off into idolatry time after time. They should endure the chastening because now God is dealing with the true believers in the nation of Israel again. When they see their loved ones die, hurt and starving, they should not allow themselves to be in bitterness against God. God is purging out the rebel from Israel, tares, and identifying the true believers, wheat. 
And I will purge out from among you the rebels, and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, Ezekiel 20 verse 38. God chastens us in the dispensation of grace using his word, other people, and the consequences of their bad choices. Paul had to chasten, reprove, and rebuke the Corinthians concerning how they behaved at the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11 verses 23 to 34. Dot. 12 Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, 13 And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. The writer warns them to stay strong, and look straight ahead at Christ, so they will not be turned out of the way of following Christ to the end and end up lame. Since you will enjoy the peaceable fruit of righteousness in the future determine just to accept the tribulation and to go straight through it without wandering off track. If you are mentally faint then you are spiritually lame, so let your fear and doubt be healed. Brace one another, lift up the hands which hang down, this may be a reference to how Aaron and her stayed up the arms of Moses during the battle against Amalek in the wilderness, Exodus 17 verses 10 to 12. The Israelites won when Moses' tired hands were held up. They have to help each other in the tribulation. They are also to help those whose knees buckle under with fear or quake in their boots. James wrote to say that they can ask for spiritual healing and strength. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5 verse 16. Make straight paths, set a direct course through the tribulation straight to Jesus and the kingdom. When they run the race stay on course straight to Jesus and be careful not to get sidetracked or tripped up. If they feel hopeless and like fainting in their minds, they are to heal their doubt by help and prayer of the elders and the reading his word and run. These verses about the knees should remind them about Isaiah 35, and they should encourage the other little flock members. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Then after he comes the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert, Isaiah 35 verses 3 to 6. They should pray for each other and tell each other to be strong in faith, and not fearful with wobbly knees or heart, fear not because God will come, and pay the evil unbelievers back and save us. They should take the straight and narrow path to Jesus which John the Baptist prepared. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight, Matt, 3 colon 3, Isaiah 40 verse 3. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Matt 7 13, 14. Those of Judea should make straight paths out into the wilderness, when Antichrist sets himself up, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, in the temple and his image. The Hebrew remnant knows not to bow down to the image, just like Daniel's three friends, who were punished by being thrown into the fiery furnace by Nebuchadnezzar for refusing to bow down to his statue, Dan 3 19, 20. Ye shall make you no idols nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall ye set up any image of stone in your land, to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God, Leviticus 26 verse 1. They will flee into the wilderness. And the woman the believing remnant of Israel fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days, Revelation 12 verse 6. Only perfect specimens can be priests therefore their physical healing will take place with their glorified bodies in the kingdom. Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach, a blind man, or a lame, or he that hath a flat nose, or anything superfluous, or a man that is broken-footed, or broken-handed, or crooked back, or a dwarf, or that hath a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or scabbed, or hath his stones broken. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron the priest shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish, he shall not come nigh to offer the bread. 
of his God, Leviticus 21 verses 17 to 21. This is why Jesus Christ came to heal everyone perfectly demonstrating by signs that he was the Messiah, PSA, 74 colon 9, 78 colon 43, Isaiah 35 verse 6, Matt for 23. Christ's followers did the same miracles, and some will do them in the tribulation. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits, to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease, Matt, 10 colon 1, Acts 3 verse 11. There are twelve apostles to Israel, Matthias replaced Judas, Acts 1 verses 21 to 26. The body of Christ receives their complete healing at the rapture, philosophy 320, 21. 14 Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, 15 Looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, 16 Lest there be any fornicator, or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. 17 For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. They are to follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. They are to get along among themselves and others. God is holy and nothing unholy can come before him. A believer must come before him having the imputed righteousness of his son. If men believe the gospel of the circumcision, that the Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah that died on the cross for Israel's sins and rose and the kingdom is at hand, when offered to them by the believers, that means they believe and will join the little flock of peacemakers Matt 5 colon 9. While they are looking to Jesus, they are also to be looking diligently to make sure the other members of the little flock will also finish the race. They are to look to make sure that none of the little flock should fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. God is showing them grace by allowing them an opportunity to get into the kingdom. If the assembly has a person that has a root of bitter spring up against God because they have to suffer persecution and death and begin to murmur and complain and think about drawing back to perdition, 1038, that person's lack of faith, bad attitude, and poor endurance could spread to the rest of the little flock group and defile or infect them. They must be on guard that there is not someone among you that is going to worship the beast and take his mark so they can eat and not be hungry for a few years rather than suffer for a while and have eternal life in the kingdom on earth. The Lord is training redeemed Israel to be partakers of his holiness. If they are not partakers of his holiness, they will not be his priests in the kingdom. They need the righteousness, or holiness, of Christ to be able to stand before God. Whatever Jew that does not endure in faith unto his second coming will not be one of his priests in the kingdom. Ungratefulness and bitterness against God and his salvation opportunity for them could defile them like Esau, perhaps his pagan wives influenced him. Because Esau was so preoccupied with eating a morsel of food instead of his faith in God's word, he lost his chance to be the one to inherit the Abrahamic covenant. No one should be profane, treat sacred things irreverently, or fornicate with the false religious system, and take the mark of the beast and sell his birthright in the kingdom as Esau did. After Esau had sold his birthright for one morsel of food, he was sorry and cried, and wanted to inherit the blessing of being the heir of the Abrahamic covenant, but he was rejected. For he found out that it was too late to change Isaac's or God's mind. Even though he cried and pleaded he had lost his chance. There is no second chance. Even if the little flock seek God with tears that will not help, they have sealed their doom. They are not to seek to worship their own belly, more than the kingdom of God. They must not take the mark of the beast in order to eat, or they will lose their souls for eternity. Taking the mark of the beast is supreme idolatry, spiritual fornication, or adultery. They need to make sure that there is no giver-upper, or weak need, or fearful among them. If they feel weak, they should ask for prayer, 1 John 5 verse 16. Esau despised the Abrahamic covenant that was to be passed to the firstborn because of temporary hunger. He sold his birthright and could not get it back. They should not sell out like Esau because they want to eat. Esau is an example of a bad choice, he was an idolater of his stomach. They must hold on to their faith and endure to the end, Matt, 2400 hours 13. 
They should not count their sacred birthright to be part of the kingdom as profane or something common. God is not going to tolerate fornicators that worship Antichrist or any profane, irreverent persons who despise their birthright to be his priests in the promised kingdom. They have no chance of getting into the kingdom if they care more about food than what God says to them from heaven. Starving to death is nothing compared to conscious eternal damnation burning in the lake of fire forever with no hope. 18 For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness, and darkness, and tempest, 19, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, 20 For they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned, or thrust through with a dart, 21 And so terrible was the sight, that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Using Mount Sinai the writer gives a vivid picture of the terror of the old covenant law that condemns, so they will not want to go back to it. Then he uses Mount Shaun to comfort and suit them with the new covenant, which they should want to move forward to. They have not come to the physical mountain that could be touched which burned with fire, covered by dark clouds, a tempestuous wind, and the loud sound of a trumpet, and a voice of stern words, which voice they that heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them any more for they could not bear to hear what was commanded, and if the mountain was so much as touched even by an animal it was stoned or thrust with a dart. Exodus 19 verses 10 to 25. Although they could touch the mountain they better not because if they did, they would be stoned or thrust through with a dart and die. The Israelites that heard God speak entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. God was not done speaking, but the people were done listening and asked not to hear any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. They could not bear to hear God say, Thou shalt not, one more time. The more of the law they heard the more they understood that they could not keep God's high standard. So scary was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Even Moses trembled at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is the ministration of death, while Mount Shaun, spelled with an S, as translated from the Greek, in heaven is the ministration of life. There is also a Mount Zion in Jerusalem on earth. 22 But ye are come unto Mount Shaun, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, 23 To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, but in contrast, you have come to Mount Shaun, to the city in heaven of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. At least two-thirds of the angels sided with God, not Satan. To the general assembly, faithful believers, and the church of the firstborn. What is the church of the firstborn? The church of the firstborn is all the churches in prophecy combined. The kingdom saints of old and the church in the wilderness, Acts 7 verse 38, and the messianic kingdom, church, Matt. 1618, and the little flock believers that during the tribulation. The general assembly are the believers in prophecy, and the church of Jesus Christ the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, Colossians 1 verse 18, Revelation 1 verse 5, in a glorified body. He is God the judge of all. The spirits of just men made perfect are with him in heaven. There is no justification apart from having God's imputed righteousness. These have their names written in heaven, most probably a reference to the book of life, Revelation 20 verse 15. Jesus said, Rejoice that your names are written in heaven, Luke 10 verse 20. They have come to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. The spirits of the Old Testament believers that died are just or justified, because they now have the imputed righteousness of Christ, and are in heaven. This verse says that the Old Testament saints are in heaven. I believe that as soon as Christ rose, he could impart his righteousness to those in paradise, and took them to heaven that same day. Paul said, Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, Romans 3 verse 25. The spirits of all believers in prophecy saved by faith are partakers of his holiness, righteousness. Paul said that paradise, Luke 23 verse 43, had been moved to heaven, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 4. But paradise will return to earth, Revelation 2 verse 7. The church the body of Christ, Ephesians 1 verses 21 and 22, 
are the true believers that will live in the heavenly places, Ephesians 2 verse 6, and has nothing to do with the kingdom church that will live on earth. Is Ephesians 4 verses 8 to 10 where Christ took Abraham's bosom to heaven? No. This is when the Lord Jesus Christ ascended, far above all heavens, because he had triumphed over Satan, Colossians 2 verse 15, Jesus Christ triumphed over Satan on the cross, and after he ascended, he gave gifts to men. He gave apostles and gifts to the little flock, Luke 11 verse 49, and he began a new church in Acts 9 and gave apostles, Paul being the primary one, and gifts to the body of Christ, Ephesians 4 verse 11. Satan along with his fallen angels became his captives. When the body of Christ's church was in its infancy and childhood they had gifts, but after Paul received the full revelation of the mystery the gifts ceased, Rom 15 29, 16 25, 1 Corinthians 13 verses 8 to 13. Paul also said in Galatians that the body of Christ should cast out the bondage of the law in an allegory of the two covenants to Israel. The Jerusalem that is above is the mother of us all Galatians for verse 26. Faithful Abraham and Sarah are our father and mother too, and we are the children of promise as Isaac was. We received Christ's imputed righteousness by faith, Genesis 15 verse 6, Romans 4 verse 16, Galatians 4 verses 28 and 31, Hebrews 11 verse 11. Remember that the body of Christ is not under any covenant see Romans 9 verse 4. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, the law of Galatians 5 verse 1. We are set free from the law by faith in Christ having received his imputed righteousness, Romans 6 verse 14, 1 Timothy 1 verse 9. Why does God let Satan live? God is letting Satan operate a little longer to see who will follow Satan and who will follow Jesus Christ. The spirits of the church of the firstborn from the dead are in heaven awaiting their resurrection. God has chosen Jerusalem on earth to be his command center from where he will rule heaven and earth, and the angels will do his instructions going up and down as pictured in Jacob's ladder, and as mentioned by the Lord, Genesis 28 verse 12, John 1 verse 51. The new Jerusalem that will come down on the new earth, Revelation 21 verse 2. The believers in mystery will already be in glorified bodies, and will probably be receiving orientation from the Lord and his angels and other saints, so that we will be ready to take up our positions occupied by Satan and his angels when they are vacated in the middle of the tribulation, Revelation 6 verses 12 to 14, 12 colon 7 dash 9, dot. 24 and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. The F ending of the King James Bible word means a continuing present tense. The sprinkling of the blood of Jesus is speaking of better things than the animal blood Abel sacrificed, because Christ's blood took not only took care of their sin problem once for all but is the blood of the new covenant. They have come to the heavenly Mount Shown, where their loving, kind, high priest king that offered himself for his people is their mediator of the new covenant, so they need not fear. Job, who had also desired a mediator, or daysman, Job 9 verses 32 and 33, is a picture of the righteous suffering during the tribulation. 25 See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, 26 whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. 27 And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. This is a formidable grim warning to not refuse or turn away from what Jesus Christ is speaking to the Hebrews from Mount Shown in heaven. If unbelievers at Sinai did not escape death, then how much more will we, Hebrews, not escape when he forcefully shakes not only heaven but the earth? If we refuse the Son of God who loved us and died in our place, and is speaking in this letter, and has given us an opportunity for eternal life, we will be shaken out, and not escape. Escape what? Escape eternal damnation. The same voice that spoke on Mount Sinai is not speaking to them from Mount Shown. God will shake out things that are not made by him. This will be a big powerful shaking. Nehemiah gave the analogy of someone shaking out unwanted crumbs from their lap. Also, I shook my lap and said, So God shake out every man from his house, nay 5.13 a.m. 
The writer quotes Haggai 2 verse 6, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. God is signifying, indicating, by the words, yet once more, that he will remove the things he can shake loose so that those things that cannot be shaken will remain, that is the kingdom. God will shake both heaven and earth during the tribulation to remove whatever should not be there so that the things that cannot be shaken will remain, Isaiah 2 verses 19 and 21. Christ will shake or cast out Satan, and the fallen angels that followed will be shaken out from the second heaven in the middle of the tribulation, Job 38 verse 13, Revelation 6 verses 12 to 14, 12 colon 7 dash 11. Revelation 12 is the war in heaven and Revelation 19 is the war on earth. Satan and his angels in heaven have to be removed so they cannot continue their influence over men in heaven and on earth. They will be cast down to earth in the middle of the tribulation. This will help make the second half of the tribulation is even worse. Satan is the accuser of our brethren, Revelation 12 verse 10. The martyrs in heaven will rejoice, and all the congregation of the firstborn will have joy when Satan is cast out. There are several severe earthquakes that will happen during the tribulation, Rev 6 12, 8 5, 11, 13, 19, 16 18. The kingdom on earth cannot be moved. Satan and his angels will make sure the believing remnant of Israel is persecuted even worse. They need to hang on while he shakes out the heavens and shakes the earth once more, and not let go, but hold on to their faith, Haggai 2.21. The one that endures to the end the same shall be saved, Matt, 2400 hours 13, into the kingdom. There will be one last gigantic shaking of heaven and earth in the tribulation. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place, in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger, Isaiah 13 verse 13. From the uttermost part of the earth have we heard songs, even glory to the righteous. But I said, My leanness, my leanness, woe unto me. The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously, yeah, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. And it shall come to pass, that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare, for the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down, the earth is clean dissolved, the earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall, and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day, that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. And they shall be gathered together, as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. Then the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem, and before his ancients gloriously, Isaiah 24 verses 16 to 23, dot. 28 Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. 29 For our God is a consuming fire. Since we, the little flock, are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. They are to have grace to make sure that those in the little flock assembly, and others also are encouraged to stay faithful to the end of the tribulation or their lives, no matter what. Some of those saved into the kingdom will be like a brand plucked out of the fire, Zechariah 3 verse 2. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, 1031. For our God is a consuming fire, Psalms 97 verses 1 to 3. The anger of the Lord will be greater toward those who do not believe his son in the tribulation. He will consume the unbelievers in Israel and cast them into a furnace of fire, Matt 1342. God is holy and nothing unholy can come before him. A consuming fire goes before the Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence, a fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him, Psalms 50 verses 1 to 3. God will not consume his believing remnant. 
When his people go through the fire during the tribulation, they will be like the burning bush that burned, but was not consumed, Malachi 3 verse 6. God will consume the rebels of Israel that reject him, Matt, 24 37-41, and the Gentiles that persecute the redeemed little flock remnant, Matt, 25 41-46. Christ will fight for the little flock and against Antichrist at the battle of Armageddon, when he comes in vengeance with his mighty angels, Matt, 25 colon 31, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7, Revelation 16 verse 16. That is when the Lord will be a man of war, Exodus 15 verse 13. In his foreknowledge, God has prepared for this battle. God asked Job, Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? Or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? Job 38 verses 22 and 23. Where is the Ark of the Covenant now? It is in his command center in heaven. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the Ark of his Testament, and there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail, Revelation 11 verse 19. The seventh vial is poured out at Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven, from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city Jerusalem, was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God, God remembered the evil at the tower of Babel, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great, Revelation 16 verses 17 to 21. Jesus Christ will be a consuming fire against his enemies, and they will have eternal fiery torment forever in the lake of fire, Revelation 20 verse 10. The Lord Jesus Christ will be victorious against the godly unbelievers that will want the rocks to hide them, but his believers will mourn. And I will pour upon the house of David, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him, as one marneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn, Zechariah 12 verse 10. But he will come in, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified, ISA, 61 colon to be, 3. His return is good for them, Isaiah 66 verse 14, but bad for his enemies. For behold, the Lord will come with fire, and with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury, and his rebuke with flames of fire, Isaiah 66 verse 15. The true believers will live in the renovated new heaven and new earth, 2 Peter 3 verses 10 to 13, Psalms 102 verses 25 to 28. This means that the body of Christ will be in the old heaven for more than a thousand years. Latter earth to heaven, Genesis 28 verse 12, Aaron and her holding Moses up. Daniel's friends refused to bow. Physical signs of his coming. Old Covenant, Hebrews 12 verses 18 to 21. New Covenant, Hebrews 12 verses 22 to 24. Not come to Mount Sinai, Exodus 19 verses 10 to 25, stand back. But we have come to Mount Shaun draw near, 1022. Might be touched but die stoned or thrust through with a dart. The city of the living God. Burned with fire. The heavenly Jerusalem, Salem equals peace. Blackness and darkness. To an innumerable company of angels. Tempest. A place of grace. To an innumerable company of angels. Sound of a trumpet. No loud sound. Voice of words. Refuse not him that speaketh, 1225. The mediator of the new covenant is the same voice which spoke on Sinai. That heard entreated that the words should not be spoken to them any more. 
A written letter, 1322. Congregation or church in the wilderness, Acts 7 verse 38. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. For they could not endure. Jesus is their example and the mediator of the new covenant. So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. His blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel, it speaks of life and the new covenant. They escaped not who refused him that spake on earth. Much more shall we not escape, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth? But now he hath promised, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven of what does not belong. Those that worship the golden calf died. The things of God will remain. The kingdom we are receiving cannot be moved, so serve God acceptably. Fire of God on Sinai, Exodus 19 verse 18, 12 18. For our God is a consuming fire. Old Covenant Ministration of Death New Covenant Ministration of Life Chapter 13 Final Practical Advice and Salutations 13,1-7 Things to Remember and Christ Does Not Change 13-10-17 Separation from the Apostate Religion and Obeying Leaders 13,18-23 Final Benediction, Warning to Listen to What Has Been Said 1324 25 Last Goodbye and Salutation The key verse or theme of Hebrews is in 1313. Israel was to be a channel of blessing to the Gentiles, Genesis 12 verse 3. Today God has changed the channel of blessing from Israel to the body of Christ. Our glory is not in what Christ can do for us through his nation, our glory is in the cross, his finished work. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world, Galatians 6 verse 14. In the future, redeemed Israel will again be the nation that is above all other nations. All nations will need to bless them. But today we beg all people, Jews and Gentiles, to believe the gospel of Christ and be saved, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. The greatest revival and salvation in prophecy of the Gentiles that the earth has ever seen will take place in the kingdom. The kingdom priests will follow Christ's command, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Matt 28, 20 while their priest king is away in exile, the believing remnant, the children of the bride chamber, will mourn and suffer, Mark 2 verses 19 and 20. In this lesson, we will be sleuths, like Sherlock Holmes, and carefully consider three possible candidates that may have been the human writer of Hebrews. Who are the strangers? Why does the writer suddenly bring up the marriage bed in 13 colon 4? Who is the bride of Christ? What does it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace mean? What is the day of the Lord and the day of God? When will the new Jerusalem come down from heaven? Who is inside the new Jerusalem? What is God's will for Israel? Who wrote the book of Hebrews? How will Lord Jesus make them perfect in every good work to do his will? Why is there no name on the Hebrews epistle? 13 colon 1 let brotherly love continue. To be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. The writer makes the main point, verse 13, and gives 12 practical admonitions before closing the letter. Brotherly love amongst the believing remnant is to continue even as things get harder and harder. The little flock will need each other and should make sure no one is kept from entering the kingdom. Who are the strangers? They should not forget to entertain or take in strangers or other little flock members that are not in their group and feed and shelter them. Apostle John described that one elder had declined to show hospitality. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore if I come, 
I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. 3 John 1 verses 9 and 10. Many of the Gentiles will believe in Israel's God, and bless the believing Jews with food, and shelter according to the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3. The persecuted remnant can wisely knock on their doors for help, Luke 11 verse 9. Angels that appeared to look like men were entertained by Abraham and Lot. Angels will again take part in doing God's will and help the heirs of salvation, 114, in prophecy. Angels may be among those the little flock invite to join them. 3. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. They are to remember people who are in prison for their faith, as if they were bound with them. They are to remember those who suffer adversity for their faith, as if they are in that group. Think that the person suffering adversity could be themselves, therefore apply the golden rule which the Lord Jesus Christ, James, and Paul all advocated, Romans 13 verse 9. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, Matt, 2239. James called it the royal law. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well, James 2 verse 8. Remember that the writer had been in bonds, 1034. They will still keep the law in the kingdom, but the law will be an even higher standard as Jesus described on the Sermon of the Mount, Matt, 5 to 7. Dot. For marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Why does the writer suddenly bring up the marriage bed? Intimacy is not to be between a man and a woman, but between a husband and wife. This verse applies to both physical and spiritual marriage. By faith, they have committed themselves to a spiritual union with the Lord, and their spirit is united with his spirit. Paul described the union that the body of Christ has with the Lord Jesus Christ. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband Ephesians 5 verses 30 to 33. In the context, those who are spiritually married to Christ are honorable, and the marriage bed between God and his believing remnant is undefiled, Revelation 19 verses 7 and 8. This reminds us of the Song of Solomon. But God will judge whoremongers, those who fornicate and idolize others, and adulterers, have idolatrous relations outside the spiritual union or marriage. They are not to embrace false doctrine, Proverbs 6 verses 20 to 35. All nations are said to have committed fornication with apostate Israel in the tribulation, Rev 17 colon 2, 18 colon 3. Those who worship Antichrist or take the mark of the beast are the whoremongers and adulterers God will judge and consume with fire. Two women in prophecy describe false doctrine, the strange, woman a harlot, apostate Israel PROV 216, 5 colon 3, 20, etc., and true doctrine, wisdom, or wise woman the believing remnant the daughter of Zion, Proverbs 1 verses 20 to 23, 7 colon 4, 14 colon 1, etc. Those who despise their birthright in the kingdom like Esau, and worship Antichrist, and take the mark of the beast are whoremongers and spiritual adulterers. It is not only a matter of not taking the mark of the beast, but of not worshipping Antichrist or his image, statue. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Revelation 20 verse 4 Who is the bride of Christ? Israel is a she, ISA, 54 colon 5, 61 colon 10, 62 colon 5, Hosea 2 verse 2, but the body of Christ is a he, the one new man, Ephesians 2 verse 15. Marriage is between the bridegroom and his bride. The believing remnant is a pure and white bride that God has loved all along. 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. 6. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what men shall do unto me. 
Let your manner of life or conduct in this life be without covetousness, wanting what others have during the tribulation. Do not want what unbelievers have, be content with such things as you do have, his promises and material things such as food, shelter, and clothing, etc. For the Lord God has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Do not covet what others have, be content with the salvation that you will have at his coming for he is a husband to you that will never leave you not forsake you. They are reminded of what Moses told them that God said, Be strong and of a good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them, for the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee, he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 Jesus is a type of Joshua, and since the kingdom, is at hand believing Israel, is in a similar situation, Joshua 1 verses 5, and 9, ready to take the promised land of the kingdom. Even when Israel was unfaithful to him the Lord stayed faithful to her, and did not pick another people to be his nation. The book of Hosea is a picture of the Lord's faithfulness and Israel's unfaithfulness. The Lord stayed faithful for the sake of the few that did believe in him. He is their helper, Psalm 72 verse 12. The Lord will help them, he is the great, I am that I am, Jehovah God. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am, and he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you, Exodus 3 verse 14, whatever their need is he says, I am he who will fill their need, they can fill in the blank themselves. We Hebrew believers can boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what men shall do unto me. The writer brings their attention to the following great psalm. The Hebrew saints can boldly say, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear, what can men do unto me? Psalms 118 verse 6 A husband and a wife are a team that helps each other. With the Lord as her husband, believing Israel has a Godman that loved her, and washed her in his own blood, so she can have the new covenant and keep his laws and be his priests and kings. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen, Revelation 1 verses 5 and 6. Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me, Lord, be thou my helper, Psalms 30 verse 10. They are not to fear what men can do to them, but fear him that has the power to decide where a soul spends eternity depending on whether they have believed the gospel of the circumcision, Psalms 56 verse 1. They should fear God, not men. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, Matt. 1028.7 Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. The little flock are to remember to take care of their leaders who have spoken the word of God to them. Apostle John gave them a list of tests to make sure that others are true, not false leaders or believers, 1 John 3:24 for colon 1, 2. Their leaders should follow what Christ said in the prophecy scriptures, his earthly ministry to the twelve apostles, and through the writers of the Hebrew epistles. There will be intensive Bible studies going on in the tribulation. They will be comparing and contrasting scripture verses with other scripture verses. 8. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, and today, and forever. 9. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Unlike diverse and strange doctrines, what Jesus Christ has said in the Bible is steadfast and reliable. Christ is not going to change what he said yesterday, in the past, and today, while the little flock are going through the tribulation, and forever Christ will always keep his promises. God will keep his promise to rapture the body of Christ, and to save the little flock of Israel into the kingdom. God will use his two groups of saved people to reclaim and subdue heaven and earth under his rule. God's true sons will be manifest at the rapture and at his second coming, John 1 verses 12 and 13, Romans 8 verse 19. He will not change his mind but keep his word to Hebrew saints, Dan 7:22. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever, Dan 7:18. Christ will not change his mind about what he has said and promised. 
He promised the land to Abraham's seed, his seed by faith. Israel's believing remnant is to be careful, not carried about with divers and strange doctrines that depart from the word of God. To not believe that Jesus of Nazareth is their Messiah is false doctrine. Many people will be deceived into believing a lie that Antichrist is Christ. The Antichrist and the false prophet will do miracles, signs, and wonders. Antichrist will even rise from the dead. The saints will know from God's word that we were raptured or caught up, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, and not stolen by aliens from outer space. Paul said that the Antichrist will not be revealed by signing the seven-year covenant with Israel until after the body of Christ is out of the way and gathered together unto him, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1. God will send the apostate Jews and unbelieving Gentiles strong delusion because they did not care to read the Bible and find out what God said. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth God's word, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness, 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 8 to 12. Even today, we notice that many hate Christ and his truth, and do not want to listen when we, as his ambassadors, extend his love to them or to read or study the Bible. What does it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace mean? It is a good thing that their hearts are established by what spiritual truth God has made known to them in the Bible rightly divided. Their leaders have spoken to them the word of God, 13, 7. As they read and study the Bible, they know that Romans to Philemon was important information given through Paul by Christ to his heaven-bound people. They should not be overly concerned about food, which has not profited the people that valued food more than God. However, it is wise to have not only survival food, but also a case of King James Bibles on hand before the tribulation, if possible. Jesus quoted scripture and said, Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, Matt, for colon 4, Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. Christ has made provision for the prophecy saints in his word. There is a flood of verses for them everywhere in the Bible, and they will be so happy that God loved them all along. He prepared his word with them in mind and told them what to do, and it will be revealed to them through the Holy Spirit. He sheweth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel, Psalms 147 verse 19. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever, Psalms 119 verse 160. When the heart believes the spiritual truth in God's word spoken unto them by Christ, the followers of the twelve apostles, their leaders, pastors, elders, and shepherds, 13 7, then their hearts are established. It is not enough for them to read or hear the Bible, the truth of God's word must be believed and go from their mind, spirit, to their heart, soul. Paul said, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, Ephesians 4 verse 23. With the help of the Holy Spirit in them, the Bible will help reprogram their minds. It will be of utmost importance that they do not forget to assemble themselves together. In their Bible studies, they will be able to confirm and predict the seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials and other supernatural events from God spoken of in the book of Revelation. Bible study helps believers grow in their understanding of God and His Word. This is how a person has stability and are sanctified by truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth, John 17 verse 17. Their ultimate example of a leader is their unchanging Lord Jesus Christ. He never changes in his immutability, holiness, righteousness, and other attributes. His mercy endureth forever PSA, 118, and 136, and so does his love for his people, the believing in Israel, and he loves the body of Christ believers and gave himself for us, Galatians 2 verse 20, Ephesians 5 verse 2. God's word never changes, he always keeps his word. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David, Psalms 89 verses 34 and 35. The same God that brought Israel out of Egypt is the same God that died on the cross for their sins. 
This Son of God will be revealed at his second coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Revelation 19 verse 16. Jesus Christ is the same God that gave up the Gentile nations at the Tower of Babel, and then appeared to Saul of Tarsus and gave him the mystery. God grafted the Gentiles into his olive tree, Romans 11 verses 13 and 17, and gave them an opportunity to be saved directly by believing what Jesus Christ did on Calvary, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4, apart from Israel during the dispensation of grace. The body of Christ has to rely on his word to us, and Israel has to rely on his word to them. His word never changes. His word is an unchanged masterpiece, a woven tapestry, and all that the believers need to know. 10. We have an altar, whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. The apostate priests who serve in the physical tabernacle in Jerusalem can eat of the sacrifices they burn on the brazen altar, which is like a giant barbecue grill, and have physical food to eat. We, Hebrew saints, have an altar, the cross of Christ, where he paid for their sins, which the apostate priests that serve in the tabernacle have no right to eat from. There may be a tabernacle tent set up in Jerusalem before the construction of the temple that takes Antichrist 2520 minus 2300 is equal to 220 days to build, Dan 814. We are the Hebrews saints, have something better, Jesus Christ's sacrifice, which is better than the animal sacrifices. Remember the book of Hebrews has proved that the real Son of God is better than the angels, better than Moses, better than Joshua has a better priesthood than Aaron, and Christ is the mediator of a better new covenant, not the old. However, if any of the priests in Jerusalem recognize their error and believe that Jesus of Nazareth is their Messiah, then they may be saved and be his priests before time runs out at the end of the tribulation. Their serving in the temple is an obstacle to them. They need to give up their religious activity, leave the temple, and go out of the city to where the little flock is meeting. Those who continue to offer animal sacrifices, after the Son of God has sacrificed his life for them is insulting the Father and Son. But if a priest realizes that the animal sacrifices are a picture of the true sacrifice the Lamb of God made then, then he can leave the priests of Satan, join the little flock, and be a priest of Jesus the Messiah. God said, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man, he that sacrificeth a lamb, as if he cut off a dog's neck, he that offereth an oblation, as if he offered swine's blood, he that burneth incense, as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them, because when I called, none did answer, when I spake, they did not hear, but they did evil before mine eyes and chose that in which I delighted not, Isaiah 66 verses 1-4. to In the dispensation of grace, righteousness is not imputed to those who believe there is some work they can do to make themselves worthy of salvation. God is only imparting the righteousness of Jesus Christ on those who believe that Jesus Christ alone did all the work necessary to save them. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, Romans 4 verse 5. Our work cannot save us, it is only our faith in what Christ has done that saves us, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. Dot. 11 For the bodies of those beasts, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. 12 Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. 13 Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Verse 13 is the key verse or theme of Hebrews. He is not in the temple, since he suffered without the gate, we, Hebrews, can too, so let us go forth unto him. 13 is the number for separation, also for rebellion and judgment, and this is a call to separation. The tribulation saints must separate themselves from apostate Israel. They are urged to leave Jerusalem and to have nothing to do with the animal sacrifices at the temple. The bodies of those beasts, whose blood was brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. The bodies of the animals sacrificed on the Day of Atonement, the bullock, ram, and a goat, 
were burned without the camp of the children of Israel in the wilderness. Let us, Hebrews, willingly suffer reproach, scorn, contempt, shame, disgrace, derision as in Psalm 79 verse 4, for believing in Jesus of Nazareth, and for being part of his little flock of followers. The Hebrew believers should be willing to abstain from participating in the temple sacrifice and go without the camp, and without the gate of the city, outside Jerusalem. Their sanctification is outside Jerusalem in the wilderness. The writer brings the reader's minds back to where Christ died on Golgotha, which is, being interpreted, the place of a skull Mark 15 verse 22, outside the city gate where the garden tombs is. Let us go and serve our Lord Jesus outside the gate of Jerusalem. Christ died on the altar so he could sanctify the people with his own blood, setting his believers apart as holy unto God. They will be partakers of his holiness, righteousness, 12.10. Without his holiness, imputed righteousness, no one will see God. They will be resurrected in glorified bodies in the kingdom, and he will make them holy by having his spirit in them according to the new covenant. Jesus said, Thy law is within my heart, Psalms 40 verse 8. He kept the law perfectly and never sinned so God's justice required that he would be raised. Jesus told the Samaritan woman, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him, John 4 verse 23. Believing Israel is to depart from unbelieving Israel, depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, Isaiah 52 verse 11. Members of the body of Christ are also to separate from false believers and false doctrine. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, set the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing physical and spiritual idolatry taught by false teachers of false doctrine, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, 2 Corinthians 6 verses 17 and 18, 7 colon 1. We are to recognize Paul's distinctive apostolic ministry to the body of Christ, Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 9. Dot. 14 For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Here they have no lasting eternal city, but they seek one to come. The present Jerusalem is not the Jerusalem of the Lord Jesus Christ, because they have rejected their Messiah, and refuse to believe his word. The Lord will establish Jerusalem as his headquarters when he returns and rules the world from there. Apostate Jerusalem is not going to continue, but they are ultimately to seek the city of the new Jerusalem, Psalms 107 verses 4 and 7, 30, 36, 41, which will continue forever. Revelation calls Jerusalem during the tribulation, Sodom and Egypt, Revelation 11 verse 8. The religion there is the pinnacle of the apostasy that began at the Tower of Babel in Babylon with Nimrod, Revelation 17 verse 15. Faith must be from the heart, not just the mind. What is the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord includes the tribulation, the judgment of the nations, Matt, 25,31-46, the millennial reign, the final rebellion of the Gentiles, and the great white throne judgment, GWTJ because those are all the things that Apostle John saw when he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, Revelation 1 verse 10. What is the day of God? After his millennial reign then will come the day of God. Remember that at the beginning of the letter the writer said that God was getting ready to fold up of the old heaven and the old earth like some worn out old robe, Hebrews 1 verses 10 and 11. Peter wrote, The heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up, 2 Peter 3 verse 10. God will burn the old heaven and earth with fire, and then renovate them, and make a new heaven and earth. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness, only believers, 2 Peter 3 verses 12 and 13. The kingdom on earth saints will need to be protected at that time in the third heaven. I believe that the new Jerusalem will hover over the earth, and that those saints will be translated into the new Jerusalem. When will the new Jerusalem come down from heaven? It will come down from heaven onto the new earth like a giant transportation chamber, or spaceship, Revelation 21 verse 2. 
Who is inside the New Jerusalem? I believe that it will be all the kingdom on earth saints. The Israel of God will be the bride of Christ. After all his enemies have been subdued under his feet, the Son will be subject to the Father that God may be all in all, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 28, and he will be called the Everlasting Father, Isaiah 9 verse 6. The Father and the Son will occupy the same throne, Revelation 21 verses 22 and 23. Dot. 15 By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. By him and by his Spirit in them, and by his grace and strength, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, which is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. His name is Jesus of Nazareth who came the first time, not the Antichrist. God wants a contrite and thankful heart, no matter what the circumstances, Psalms 50 verses 14 and 15, 23. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise, Psalms 51 verse 17. But the wicked unbelievers are as explained in Psalm 50 verses 16 and 17. O that man would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving, and declare his works with rejoicing, Psalms 107 verses 21 and 22. Accept, I beseech thee, the freewill offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments, Psalms 119 verse 108. Psalm 145 to 150 All praise the Lord. Peter said, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 1 Peter 2 verses 9 and 10. The believing remnant, redeemed Israel, was not the nation before, but now God has made them his nation. In the future, they will need to be able to speak in tongues, other languages. Thus, said the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass, that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Zechariah 8 verse 23. Dot. 16 But to do good and to communicate forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. But do not forget to do good and share spiritual and physical supplies. God is well pleased with such sacrifices as mercy, kindness, compassion, contributing food, shelter, clothing, medicine, and money during the tribulation. James said, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. James 1 verse 22. Dot. 17 Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Obey your little flock leaders that are in charge of you, and have the great responsibility to teach you the truth of the word of God. Their leaders are their pastors and shepherds. For they will need to give an account to God. James wrote, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. James 3 verse 1 Peter said that their elders should be examples to the flock. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. 1 Peter 5 verses 1 to 3. Let them teach you with joy, and not grief. For you will not gain much if you are not teachable, or easy for them to teach. 18 Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience, in all things willing to live honestly. 19 But I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. The writer has written to the little flock about the future, and now asks for prayer, so that he can come to them in safety. He trusts that he and the other little flock writers can have a good conscience by having done all that they could to help them in the future. They all want to live honestly and tell the truth. All believers should have a good conscience toward God. Apostle John wrote, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. 1 John 2 verse 16. 
Apostle Peter also warned that they can lose their salvation if their faith does not endure to the end, and they go back to trusting the world instead of God. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein, and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, than, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire, 2 Peter 2 verses 20-22. They were washed clean but lost their salvation. But in the body of Christ, we are secure, and once saved always save, Romans 8 verses 38 and 39. Dot. 20 Now the God of peace, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, 21 Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. The writer prays for them. The God of peace can show them grace because Christ interspersed his cross before the tribulation. The Father took out his wrath against the sin of Adam and all mankind on his Son, and his blood paid for their sins. God's anger was appeased, but he will only impute his Son's righteousness to believers. His Son made reconciliation between God and mankind. The God of peace is now free to impart or impute the righteousness of his Son Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all of them that believe Romans 3 verse 22. No one can stand before holy God without his righteousness, holiness. Jesus Christ sacrificed the blood that moderated the everlasting new covenant that he will implement in the kingdom possible. The God of peace brought to life again from the dead the Lord Jesus, that great shepherd. The sheep are to follow him through the tribulation, the shadow of death, Psalms 23 verse 4 and into Christ's eternal kingdom, PSA, 24. Because he rose, they will also be resurrected in the kingdom. How will Lord Jesus make them perfect in every good work to do his will? He will do it through the everlasting covenant, which is the new covenant. Jesus Christ kept the law perfectly which he had in his heart, and with his spirit in them they will do the same, Psalms 40 verse 8. Working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, his Spirit is working in, and through them to help them understand His Word, and do His will. They will be growing spiritually and go from the milk of the Word to the meat. The redeemed of Israel have been born again by the Spirit individually, and will be born again nationally, at His second coming, when they receive the new covenant and their glorified bodies. To whom be glory for ever and ever. Since the Spirit of Jesus Christ does the work, He receives the glory. Amen, so be it. What is God's will for Israel? It is for all Israel to be saved, Romans 11 verse 26. Dot. 22 And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. The writer who has warned them for their own good, now says, I beg you to make allowance for these words of warning and seriously take them to heart, because I wrote these instructions to you as briefly as I could. The conciseness of the book of Hebrews and all the Bible is profound. 23 Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. He wants the other little flock members to know that Timothy had been released from detention jail, and if he comes to the writer, he will bring Timothy with him when he comes to them. This may be another Timothy or the Timothy that was Paul's son in the faith, 1 Timothy 1 verse 2. That Timothy was a body of Christ member, but he was a brother because he was also in Christ. Many of the little flock members were in Christ by faith before Paul and Timothy, Acts 26 verse 18, Romans 16 verse 7, Galatians 1 verse 22. The kingdom of God is made up of two realms, heaven and earth, Ephesians 1 verses 9 and 10. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? God is the author of Hebrews, and the name of the human writer is unknown but we can speculate who he might be. There are three good contenders for the human writer Silas, Mark, and Luke, unless the writer is someone that is unknown to us in scripture. We need to be sleuths like Sherlock Holmes. I will tell you what my theory was, and that I have changed my mind. Then I will tell you the theory of Pastor Brian Ross of Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, 
which he taught on August 18, 2019, in a theology lesson on YouTube. Make up your own mind since we may be completely wrong. We can piece together some clues. The human writer was someone who had heard Peter and the little flock preach Christ's earthly kingdom gospel at Pentecost. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, Jesus in his earthly ministry, and was confirmed unto us the writer is in this group by them of the twelve that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Hebrews 2 verses 3 and 4 Hebrews was written in the last days, before the wrath, and the kingdom, Hebrews 1 verse 2. The dispensation of grace had interrupted prophecy the writer writes to those in the world to come, Hebrews 2 verse 5, after the rapture, Romans 11 verse 25. It was clearly not written by Paul because the doctrine is not grace but law. Furthermore, Paul was saved by Christ on the road to Damascus in Acts 9 not from hearing the apostles preach on Pentecost in Acts 2. In fact, Paul ruthlessly persecuted the kingdom church until he was saved, Acts 8 colon 1, 9 colon 1, 26 colon 11. Paul's hope was to be raptured, not to live in the kingdom on earth. However, there are some similarities in Hebrews to what Paul preached. One reason for that is because both letters are written after the cross, and another reason is that the writer of Hebrews was familiar with what Paul taught. Of course, all writers are inspired by God, but God often utilizes the writer's experience. I used to believe that Silas wrote Hebrews. Paul sent Silas and Timothy to check on the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 5. Although a member of the little flock, Silas decided to join Paul on his second apostolic journey and be part of what God was doing through Paul. Perhaps Timothy and Silas had been put in jail on their return from Thessalonica. After they were released Silas and Timothy may have traveled across Macedonia on the famous Roman road, the Ignatian Way, and taken a ship to the heel of the Italian boot, and then come to Corinth by sea via Sencria. Notice that he says, they of Italy salute you, in Hebrews 13 verse 24, not that it is written from Italy. This is a plausible alternative route to Corinth to meet up with Paul, Acts 18 verse 5. I thought it possible that Silas may have written Hebrews at that time, while waiting for Timothy to be released. Silas was a prophet, Acts 15 verse 32. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. Salute all of them that have the rule over you, Peter, James, and John, and all the saints. They of Italy salute you, Hebrews 13 verses 23 and 24. If the writer was not Silas, then it was another believer who heard Peter's group, and knew a Timothy, possibly another Timothy. Silas knew that God was currently dispensing grace, so all people could believe the gospel of Christ, and have eternal life in heaven. Silas knew that after the Jerusalem council, Paul had said that only his gospel is to be preached, Galatians 1 verses 6 to 9. Asterisk note all of Paul's epistles were written after the Jerusalem council. Therefore, Silas knowingly writes of the world to come after the rapture. Israel will be encouraged when they see that God has fulfilled his promise of the rapture for the body of Christ, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 10. The important thing is not knowing the human writer of Hebrews, but what God said. Other candidates are Mark and Luke. Pastor Brian Ross believes that Mark may have written Hebrews. He said that Silas would have had signs to confirm what Paul said, and the writer did not use signs. But I think he could have just confirmed that he had a copy of the letter which James and the council wrote in Acts 15 verses 23 to 29. The Bible does not say that Silas did signs. Pastor Ross pointed out that Timothy was asked by Paul to bring John Mark to Rome, therefore placing them both there. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry, 2 Timothy 4 verse 11. It is likely that the atmosphere was very hostile in Rome against Christians at that time. Secular history asserts that Nero blamed the Christians for the fires that he set in Rome that killed many people. The Christians were being persecuted and Timothy and Mark may have been imprisoned for a while. The little flock saints in Italy may have helped them. During the Acts period, 
There were pockets of Paul's and Peter's followers until Peter's followers died out because they had agreed not to take on any more converts. The verses in Galatians 2 verses 7 to 9 can clear up a great deal of confusion about the Bible. Brian Ross admits that would mean that Hebrews was written after 2 Timothy. He also says that 2 Peter may have been written afterward because Peter said, all his epistles. It was all his letters up to that time. Furthermore, Paul also said, all scripture, 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, as if all scriptures were written. I appreciate and enjoy Pastor Brian Ross's courage to come out with this intriguing possibility. The theory of Silas allows 2 Timothy to be written last in the Bible, but so does another candidate. If Luke and Timothy escorted Phoebe part of the way to Italy with the letter to the Romans, Acts 20 verse 4, and were jailed somewhere in Italy toward the end of the three months Paul stayed in Corinth, Luke could have written Hebrews then. Paul had decided to go to Jerusalem in Acts 19 verse 21. Luke and Timotheus accompanied Paul to Jerusalem, Acts 20 verses 4 and 6. Therefore, who wrote Hebrews is elementary, my dear Watson. I now believe that the best candidate for the human writer of Hebrews is the modest and humble Dr. Luke. Luke would then have written Hebrews before Paul wrote 2 Timothy. Paul said he was given the task to fulfill the word of God, Colossians 1 verse 25. If Hebrews was written after Paul died, then I think the writer would have mentioned Paul. It will be interesting to find out from the Lord who really wrote Hebrews because we do not know and are not told. 24 Salute all of them that have the rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Salute your leaders that rule and are in charge of you for me. The writer is known by the readers and their leaders. He is not one of their leaders. The letter is most likely written from Italy. It does not say where in Italy, but that the Italian believers send their greetings. The letter was most likely sent to Jerusalem because of the many references to that city. 25 Grace be with you all. Amen. This salutation was common. John closes the book of Revelation with it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Revelation 22 verse 21. It does not mean that Paul wrote the letter because this letter does not begin with his name like all 13 of his letters to the body of Christ do. This letter is obviously written by a member of the little flock who is looking for Christ's second coming, not the rapture. Eight reasons why Paul did not write Hebrews are listed at the beginning of this book. Why is there no name on the Hebrews epistle? Because the writer wants to exalt Christ. The human writer is irrelevant, and would detract from the Son's loving words to them. They can forget who the human writer is because it is Jesus talking to them from heaven about the kingdom program. Luke is most likely a little flock member. He humbly did not put his name in the Gospel of Luke or in Acts but wrote both. John Mark did not put his name in his Gospel either. But Silas, also called by the Latin Silvanus, did sign his name as the amanuensis for Peter, 1 Peter 5 verse 12. Furthermore, if the writer's name were on the letter he could be persecuted if the letter were intercepted. The true Hebrew believers will endure to the end. Look unto Jesus not the waves. To be his priests join the little flock. The five courses of chastisement for Israel. Jacob's trouble is the seven years of tribulation, which is the last part of the installment of Israel's five courses of chastisement, which are mentioned in Leviticus 26. In Leviticus 26 verses 1 to 13, God promised Israel blessings if they worship and obeyed him, but in Leviticus 26 verses 14 to 39 God warns Israel that he will punish them if they worship idols of spiritual adultery, and do not obey his commands. Then in Leviticus 26 verses 40 to 46, God comforts them saying he will keep his covenant with them. The first course of chastisement is in Leviticus 26 verses 16 and 17 physical illnesses, Enemies will reign over them and eat their harvest, Gideon, Ruth, Judd. 2.13, 1 Sam, 1-16. The second course of chastisement Leviticus 26 verses 18 to 20 drought, no rain Elijah, God will not hear from heaven the land shall not yield her increase, famine, the trees no fruit. To break their pride, the kingdom is divided because of Solomon's sins and God says he will punish them, seven times more, 1 Kings 12-22. 
The third course of chastisement Leviticus 26 verses 21 and 22. If ye walk contrary unto me, the wild beasts will rob you of your children. They will be left few in number, Elisha, 2 Kings 1 to 10 31. Again it will be seven times more. The fourth course of chastisement Leviticus 26 verses 23 to 26. If ye will not reform then, I will walk contrary to you. Pestilence, disease, famine, and sword. Greater oppression of their enemies, invasions, lengthy sieges, and occupation of their land, 2 Kings 10 32 to 1620, yet seven times for your sins. The fifth course of chastisement is his fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins, Leviticus 26 verses 27 to 39. There will be severe famine and destruction of their cities and the sanctuary. God will not accept their sacrifices. Removal from their land. The Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom and Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom of Judah, 2 Kings 17 colon 1 25 colon 30. Jeremiah, Dan 9 colon 2, said 70 years were necessary to cleanse the land and allow her Sabbaths. Then for 190 years to cleanse the people was given to Daniel, Dan 9 colon 24 27. However, God will still keep the Abrahamic covenant with his people. In Leviticus 26 verses 40 to 46, God says that if they confess their sins and humble themselves God will remember his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the land and not cast them away or destroy them utterly. God will remember why he brought his people out of Egypt and parted the Red Sea for them, that he might be Israel's God. The tribulation will complete the 70 weeks of Daniel's timeline and finish the transgression of Israel, Dan 9.26. Daniel interpreted King Nebuchadnezzar's dream which revealed that the time of the Gentiles is over when the smiting stone destroys those kingdoms, Christ at his second coming. The stone becomes a gigantic mountain, a great kingdom, with the king of the Jews, Jesus ruling. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth Dan 2 colon 31-35, Luke 21 verse 24. This is the end of the Missing the Rapture Jacob's Trouble Part 6 series. God bless you.